Council meeting for Monday, February 3rd. Uh, Mary, will you do us the pleasure of a uh, Pledge of Allegiance? Sorry. Dolores? Councilor Dolores um, before we start we do have a presentation from the MDC today uh, we don't have our uh, commissioners here commissioners Adel, Camilleri and um, Pierre Cardo uh, <laughs> the, the names like escape me <laughs> I know <laughs> uh, the one Republican yep. <laughs> uh, so we do have our commissioners in attendance tonight uh, we welcome you to uh, the council meeting uh, Mr. Jellison, yes. please. Thank you. Um, yeah, yes, we're going to go straight into the presentation. Uh, so thank you for uh, the invitation, and we're going to give you a brief uh, version of a very long um, uh, integrated planning presentation. And the lucky part is you're not going to hear from me. You're going to hear from our chief engineer, uh, Jason Waterbury. Jason is uh, intimately involved in, in dealing with the Clean Water Project and he's our <laughs> go-to person for the project. So the one thing we are going to show you, we're going to show you one video um, and it's, re you know, as you remember when we came in here we showed you four videos and those videos cost us about $600 a piece. We've made a new video and we're constantly making new videos. This one is specific to the integrated plan. So we'd like to show that first and... Um, and Scott, is that going to be I talked to Nick earlier that that's one that's going to be available on uh, um, cable access for us as well. Yes. Great. Thank you. So is it, uh, where is it? Yeah. Yeah. The MDC proposed implementing an integrated plan to manage the next phase of the Clean Water Project or CWP. The plan establishes a framework and schedule that will allow the district to satisfy the current needs of its aging sewer system and meet the CWP's regulatory requirements. How does the MDC balance these important priorities and keep customer costs in check? Integrated planning is a strategy that combines the federally and state mandated clean water project work with improvement projects to the existing aging sewer system. By extending the CWP schedule over a longer period of time and integrating repairs and improvement projects, the MDC can more effectively use funds and control costs. Integrated planning will ultimately benefit MDC customers through more planned sewer repairs, which cost less than emergency repairs when old pipes fail, smaller sewer separation projects to avoid lengthy construction work and minimize disruptions to neighborhoods, Integrated planning makes sense. Building large tunnels and bigger treatment plants is only effective if the pipes carrying the wastewater are in good repair. Given more time, the MDC can achieve the CWP's regulatory obligations while also repairing existing pipes before they fail, saving ratepayers money and achieving water quality goals. Learn more. everyone. I'm going to skim through a couple of initial slides because I'm trying to keep this as quick as brief as possible. Um, first slide was the agenda of what we're going to be covering today. Um, I'm really going to skip to item two which is the integrating planning piece. This was all the work that we have done to date. Uh, a lot of it which we've talked to uh, council before at prior meetings. This is showing the progress we've made to date. It's kind of important to stop here for a second. When the Clean Water Project started, uh, in 2006, 
we were on a typical year releasing about a billion gallons of uh, combined sewage into the Connecticut River uh, and other surface water bodies within the Hartford area. Uh, through all the work we've done to date, in a typical year, we're down to about 490 million gallons. Uh, as you know, the tunnel is in construction right now. Once the tunnel goes online in 2023, that'll go down to 436 million gallons in a typical year. So really what we're talking about for the remaining uh, clean water project work, the focus of it is addressing that 436 million gallons in a typical year. Um, this was highlighting the work that we've done in Weathersfield and, and you know, no matter what changes we're discussing here with the integrated plan versus prior plans, we're still, the, the, we're, one of the focuses is still to eliminate CSOs to the Weathersfield Cove and actually that schedule does not change um, because that is still being addressed by the tunnel itself. <coughs> So far to date in Weathersfield, we've rehabbed about 32% of the system. Uh, that's about, works out to be about 39 miles of, of pipe. Um, the key projects are the two lining contracts, the Golf Brook project and the Rocky Hill project also closed a sanitary sewer overflow. Um, and then we've got the tunnel contract two is in construction right now and contract four is in bidding and contract five is in execution. Four is the one that can, uh, contains the CSOs from the Franklin Avenue area, which go to the Cove. Now integrated planning, uh, before I get into this, one of the main parts of the Clean Water Project was the consent order and consent decree. Consent order was the CSOs in Hartford, which is obviously part of that is the ones that go to the Cove. The consent decree were the SSOs, one of which was Goff Brook. Another big piece of the, of this, the consent decree is CMOM. And CMOM is basically the EPA's way of dictating how to maint better maintain a uh, sewer system. You inspect your system, you clean your system, you find a problem, you fix it right away. Um, there's a lot, it's a lot more complicated than that, but in, in, in its base form, that's what it is. But the other part of it is it really never goes away. CMOM goes on forever. Um, so that's a key aspect to keep in the back of your mind as we continue talking on this. Um, and integrated planning, what we were trying, another key point I wanna make before we go into other slides is that we were really trying to address the root cause of the problem and not just the symptoms. So in other words, not just picking up the CSOs at the end of the pipe, but preventing them from actually getting, extra water from actually getting there. Um, as the video mentioned was the emergency repairs and how costly they can be. Um, this is one of the main problems that the district has been having and it does actually have an Im immediate impact on each of our member towns because these repairs are funded uh, through our capital budget, which is funded from Ad Valorem. Um, as you can see, it's really been escalating over the last couple of years. Uh, 2019, we hit 8.6 million in emergency repairs. Emergency repairs, the pipes break, we can't exactly just say, no, we don't have the money, you can't go fix it. We have to go fix it. When the pipe breaks and the road collapses, like you see in that picture, there's, there's no other way around it. Um, so one of the key um, goals with integrated planning is to fix the pipes before they get to that level of repair. Um, and in, in reality, it's aging sewers that get to this point, and the district sewers are aging. Another key point of this, and this goes back to CMOM, is getting the extra water out of the system. Uh, on a dry day, weather sealed sewers, Hartford sewers, they flow fine, you don't have any backups. Unless there's a, a pipe collapse, obviously, but you don't have any backups. It's on a wet day when all the extra water gets into the collection system, that's when the overflows occur. And what this picture is dictating is how that water gets into the sewer, whether it be the roof leader or catch basin or leaky pipes, which are the cracks on the screen and the pipes on the screen. Um, that's groundwater coming in or rain or rainwater flowing down through the ground and getting into the pipes. So integrated planning, <coughs> we basically took a three step process where the first up the top of the screen, you'll see kind of like a series of buckets. Um, I think this slide has probably been shown here a couple times before. Uh, in essence, all we, what we wanted to do is identify all the needs of the system. So I mentioned CMOM, CMOM is one of those needs. It's the collection system. You, it generates a list of basically to-do list of pipes that need to be fixed and addressed. Um, but our pump stations have needs, our four wastewater pollution control facilities have needs, the stormwater system in Hartford has needs, and you know there's all of the MDC's assets have needs. Now, as part of the consent order, we have to update our long-term control plan every five years. Um, the due date was 2018, December of 18. So while we were going through and figuring out what are all the needs of all our assets, we also went ahead and said, okay, what um, improvements can we make to the collection system? What different options do we have to comply with the consent order, which is really uh, eliminating the CSOs to the north branch of the Park River at this point and controlling the other ones to only a one-year storm. 
Now, when we came up with the list of needs and came up with the list of projects that solved the CSO problem, we then took the, took the next step, and this is the step that's new to this, to the, the district, and this is the integrating planning step, which is basically identifying the projects that achieve both goals. So if there's a project that fixes a broken pipe and helps the CSO system or reduces an SSO, then that project rises higher on the list of things to do. So it, we're trying to kill multiple birds with one stone is, is kind of the comparison. <clears throat> so there's a number of benefits. Uh, these, this slide was taken out of the public hearing, uh, which some of you may have seen. But one of the benefits is by trying to focus on that aging infrastructure rather than building another tunnel right now, we can better predict where we're going to be and when we're going to be, uh, which is a benefit to the towns. Um, and also by, and I'll get to this later on in the presentation, by using the clean water project <coughs> to address the aging infrastructure, to, which then reduces CSOs and SSOs, those projects can then be part of the clean water project budget rather, po rather than the Adva Warren budget. And that's kind of a key difference, and I know we've, we've kind of hit on it before at prior meetings, but that's a big benefit of the towns because then it leads to a more stable Adva Warren predictability rather than some years going up and down. Now to our customers, it's less disruption because we're hopefully not doing as many emergency repairs. Um, it's more planned repairs. We can say, okay, we're gonna be here next year or later on this year. And because the projects would then be, some of them could be then considered CSO projects and this is what we're working with the state on, we can then use grant or loan money for some of these projects which then would be lower cost because these rehab projects would be used for CSO and toward, to mitigate, to address the aging infrastructure. Now, none of the environmental goals of the original Clean Water Project are changing. Um, we're still gonna comply with the consent order, we're still gonna comply with the consent decree, and the nitrogen goals that were in the consent order are still being complied with. The main difference is that the timeline on the CSO side is being extended in certain parts of the city. That's really the main difference. Um, from the original plan to now. And I'll, there's a graph later on, I'll show you this, where it shows up a little bit better. Now I was talking about the aging infrastructure. So under the integrated plan, our focus is gonna be addressing not only the sewers in Hartford, but the sewers that flow into Hartford, which includes part of Wethersfield. We've rehabbed 32% of Wethersfield to date. We're gonna rehab another 22%. So the, one of the benefits to this is that it keeps Weathersfield's average age sewer and the district's average age sewers under 50 years. When you design a sewer pipe, you design it to last about 100 years. So if you have sewer pipes that are designed to last 100 years, you want your average age to be about 50. If we don't take this approach and decide to not focus on the existing infrastructure and go with the, the, the current plan that DEEP had approved back in 2012, that infrastructure will get to be about 75 years in age. And that's important because that's just gonna lead to more emergency type repairs. And that's what we're trying to stay away from after seeing the prices of those go up the last couple of years. So the long-term control plan is basically the roadmap of how we comply with the consent order. It was done originally in 05, it was approved in, 0, in 07. Uh, we are allowed, we are required to update it every five years. So the, the subsequent update was 2012. It was then approved in 2015. Uh, Deep then requested that we do another update in 2018, uh, which is what we did. And the main difference between the 2012 plan, which was approved in 15 and now, is the northern half of the city. The south tunnel is still happening, that's in construction. We're still doing a, a tunnel to the downtown area to pick up the CSOs in the downtown area. The, there's just, we cannot separate that area of the city efficiently to get the level of control we need. However, where we took a pause button from the last plan was we compared a tunnel in the north and separation in the north. Um, and one of the main reasons we did this was the, the, the frequency of repairs. Um, the, there's, we also have the aging water main infrastructure, which I'll get to later on. And um, we just, quite frankly, know more about a collection system now than we did in 07 and 05. We've, we've done a, a significant amount of inspection work because of that CMON program, we now know you know, how much work we have left to do to address the aging infrastructure. So we said, okay, if we separate and rehab pipes, what happens? Well, we can separate those two big blue blobs on the screen 
the one on the left hand side is the Granby area, the one in the middle is the Gully Brook area. Um, if we separate those two areas, we comply with the consent order. So we said, okay, if we can do that and comply with the consent order, we don't need to drill a tunnel because now we've addressed the aging infrastructure and we've addressed the environmental benefit, the goal of the consent order. The main difference is that because we're, we are addressing aging infrastructure, it is slightly more expensive. However, in doing the tunneling approach, we're not touching the aging infrastructure. So basically that old pipe just keeps on getting older and older and older as we're focused on building a tunnel. And eventually it too will fail. Um, it's also one of the other key aspects of this is in doing the separation work, every single time we do a project, there's gonna be a reduction in CSO and environmental benefit as opposed to the tunnel where there's no benefit until the tunnel's done and online. And if we started right now, it wouldn't be done until probably 2032, 2033. Um, so that's another key difference is we can start the separation work right away. So this is a, just a summary of the long-term control plan. Um, the base assumption was that by rehabbing our system and um, doing the sewer separation work, well, by rehabbing a system alone, we'll reduce CSOs by about a quarter, 25% in a typical year. Um, and then also, some of the other benefits in not doing the tunnel right away was that every time we, we do a rehab project, we're, we're estimating how much water we're gonna remove from the system, how much of that extra water. But we use very, we're engineers, we use very conservative estimates. Um, so we're typically, we'll underestimate a little bit. So by doing all the separation work first and the rehab work first, we can then meter afterwards and see how much we've got, gotten out and the tunnel potentially could be a little smaller. So we, that way we're not building t a tunnel that's too big. We're building the right size tunnel. Um, it also allow us to learn from the lessons of owning and operating and building the first tunnel, the one that's going to stop the CSOs to the cove, and it'll allow us to retire some of the debt from that tunnel and the treatment plant before taking on the debt for this new downtown tunnel. So some of the financial impacts to all of this. That CMOM piece I talked about, that's an EPA requirement. Um, EPA doesn't, won't let us hit the pause button. We have to continue. Um, they said they don't really care what the condition, what the status of the integrated plan is, a long-term control plan, we have to continue. We have to continue to fix our system. Um, so that, that's happening no matter what. Um, what we're trying to do is combine the two aspects together. However, because of the fact that the integrated plan isn't approved yet, we have no other funding mechanism right now other than ad valorem, or capital improvement, which is ad valorem, for the CMOM piece. So that's why in 2020, if you remember from the budgetary um, presentations, there was a $14.6 million project for rehab in Hartford on our CIP. Um, and then what you see on the screen is forecast out. Now, once the integrated plan is approved, um, the next step would be go to referenda, um, at which time these items would not be a capital improvement project, aka an ad valorem project, they would be on the clean water project. So that is, that is the path that we're trying to go down right now, is to avoid these large projects on the capital side and rather put it on the clean water side where they do justifiably belong. Um, this slide was also taken for the public hearing. The, the, the basic gist of this is that we have done a very, a very, very good job at, look for a better adjective than that, but a very good job at uh, maximizing state funding to date. I know there's been, we've had presentations before, the comments have been trying to get more state funding. We had originally budgeted or forecast we'd, we'd fund with MDC bonds about two thirds of the whole clean water project. It, we're gonna end up being about 40%. Um, and, and maybe we'll end up improving it, but that's where we stand right now, um, is getting about 23% in grants and 34% 30, in loan. Now there's a lot of numbers on this slide. Um, the key, there's a couple key ones that I'll point out. The top one is $5.30. That was the clean water project charge um, prior to doing this long-term control plan update is the status quo 530. However, that does not include the costs that the customer pays via ad valorem or property tax for all the capital work. That is pure CSO and SSO work, pure consent order, consent decree work. In similar fashion, the line below that 620, that is, again, that the only difference between the 530 and the 620 is extending it out a couple years, and that's the escalation. 
the 790 below that, that is if we added in the rehab, but still focused on, the, still did the tunnel. So that'd be the tunnel plus the rehab, if we, which would be the only path to complying with 2032, which is the likely date that deforms right now. However, what we're proposing is what you see down a couple lines below that, which is 740 and 710. 740 is the one which is the integrated plan, <coughs> and 710 is our target. Um, the only difference between the two of them is how much of that rehab work we get via grant versus loan. Um, so those are the two numbers that we're targeting right now. Now, remember, those two numbers include all of the rehab work that would have been done at, under Ad Valorem. So you can't, it's not an apples to apples when you're comparing that to the $5.30. And this is the, when you do the math and expand it out, scenario one, would, which would have been that $5.30 cost, scenario two is the $7.40 cost. Um, you'll see that by doing the integrated plan, the average cost to a Weathersfield resident is lower over the course of the whole program. Uh, the green is what represents the ad valorem piece. And you can see um, scenario two, which is the bars on the right, they kind of go up a little bit. They go up every year, because there are some, we can never completely get everything off of that system. But they don't go up as exponentially as they do under scenario one. And that's because in scenario one, the breaks and emergency repairs and rehab is included on the ad valorem side. So what's next? Hopefully I complied the 15 minutes. Um, the we're really here asking for your support. How did I do? 15 minutes, give or take? Okay, quicker than Scott? Okay. Quicker than Scott? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Given day, yeah. Okay. Just a little slow. Okay. Um, what we're asking for is your support. Um, we've gotten letters of resolution from six to eight member towns. Um, those were issued usually about a, uh, back in December of 18, November of 18 to January of 19 timeframe. We're still working with DEEP. Um, we, we've met with them multiple times. We got comments back from them initially in July, and then we met with them in October um, where they asked for an executive summary because we basically, we handed them three volumes of paper that were about that thick, I'm not kidding. And we, they met with us in October and said, we don't understand this, we need a smaller version. So we've given them an exec, uh, I think it's like a 70 page executive summary. Um, so that's where we are right now, going back and forth. Um, so we're just, we're. The quicker we get to their approval, the quicker we can move forward. And that's the, the, the basic gist that I want to leave with. Any questions? Great, thank you. <coughs> Any questions? Uh, Kevin Mayor, um, regarding DEEP, um, I'm new to the council here. Can you, you know, what, can you explain to me briefly um, what type, what's the relationship between the MDC and DEEP? Do they need to approve anything? Is, there, is it oversight? Um, just how, how does that work? So on the consent order, they have to approve the long-term control plan. Um, they don't have any jurisdiction repro re approving consent decree projects because that's under EPA. So the long-term control plan, which is all the projects under that um, are to do with C the CSO system in Hartford, that plan requires DEEP approval. We're asking them to approve that plan and the integrated plan that went with it. Because the integrated plan includes the affordability analysis and the schedule um, because of the fact that it's not just the CSO projects. Okay, and um, yep. so, so if I could, oh, sure. I'm sorry, you yep. get, get away without me saying something. So, but this is really important. Uh, as Jay mentioned, the CMOM piece, the tunnel piece to West Hartford and Newington, that's EPA Boston, has nothing to do uh, with the CSO piece that we're talking about getting approved. So we've already spent $1.7 billion, and now we're gonna spend another billion dollars in Hartford. Um, and so w what we're gonna be faced with uh, in this approval process is we're asking DEEP to approve the integrated plan because the tunnel, as Jay mentioned, is already approved by EPA, and when we complete that, the consent decree issues will be over by 2023. But we're gonna ask the state to approve an integrated plan. We've got good vibes that they're, 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 it's a positive discussion and they are, we think they are gonna approve it. But there's a very important component to this and it was Jay's, one of Jay's last slides. How long it takes them to approve, there's 3% escalation on $1 billion, right? Every year, uh, it took us three years 
uh, from 2012 to 2015 to get approval. That was three years of 3% escalation. That's real money, and that, that changes that, that cost of the clean water surcharge on your water bill. Um, so we need an approval. We need approval quickly. We'll have to go to referendum once we get an approval. We'll only go to referendum if they approve what we can support. Um, if they don't give us the grant and loan that we expect, and, and somebody asked me the question, well, why do you think that? You know, my first email I sent out, I think all the councils got it, because of public statements by our governor that said we're on a debt diet. So there's rumors that there may not be the clean water grant and loan funds that were available. We're, hope, we're hopeful there is, but, um, but more importantly, DEEP has said to me directly and to us, the MDC, that they don't believe, they, they never liked integrated planning, they don't understand it. The, the EPA um, National uh, District in DC and, and EPA Boston, Congress has passed a law that says you shall consider integrated planning for the Clean Water Act. So there's pressure on DEEP Connecticut to support this integrated plan. But what they don't like is that their logic is you're going to use our clean water funding uh, and take it away from other towns uh, to use it to fix up your old system. And our position is, what do you care? As long as we comply with the consent order and consent decree, what does it matter what we spend it on? The, the real issue between integrated planning and, and the original proposal of building tunnels is what you're spending your money on. We want to spend our money on existing old infrastructure that's fallen apart. Because if your old infrastructure is falling apart, and that's the infrastructure that gets the overflows to the brand new tunnel, can you imagine we build a nice new tunnel, but we can't get the overflows to the tunnel? That's what we're talking about. It's about what you're spending your money on. So we would need a referendum approval, and the concern we have is given all the budgetary discussions we've had, um, will a third referendum pass? Even if we get everything we ask for, Right now, the clean water surcharge on the water bill is $4.10. And as, as Jay mentioned, the expectation is it's going to go up to four, $7 and change somewhere, depending on when it gets approved. But that's doubling the, the bill. Right now, it's $410 on your water bill for the year. It, it, it's going to be roughly eight, even if we get what we ask for. And if we don't get that grant and loan money, that's going to go to $12. It's going to be $1,200 just for the clean water surcharge. So it's really important to not just get the integrated plan approved, but to make sure that DEEP can't remove the grant and loan portions that we were expecting. Because when we started this in 2004, um, we built models, we built cash flow models of exactly how much money we needed um, and when we needed it in the project. And, and it's all based on the assumptions that we worked with the state that we would get a certain amount of grant money for these projects. Um, all right, you can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm all for supporting the uh, the program. That anything that would reduce our residents' water bills, sewer bills. I have a question on uh, the ad valerum. Is it all capital improvements or is it just sewer? So if you open a road up and replace sewer lines and water mains, is that all funded through ad valerum? No. So ad valorem, uh, as Jay, one of Jay's slides, uh, the important part of this, and we really stress this in this year's budget, is we have CMOM, which is an unfunded mandate. It, there's, there's literally, uh, it will go on forever. So, and, D, and, and EPA did that on purpose. They said, you will forever continue to clean your system, and every time we clean our system, um, Jay didn't mention it, but there's $400 million worth of work that wasn't even budgeted anywhere. And if it, and if it doesn't get incorporated into the integrated plan, it has to be paid for by Avalorum, the towns, because otherwise you can't get the overflows to the tunnel. So. Um, the Avalorum can only pay for sewer. Um, we're trying desperately to get an integrated plan approved as quickly as possible so we can say to EPA Boston, we have a plan, we're going to go to referendum, 
we hit the towns this one year with sixteen million dollars worth of work but we don't want to continue that for the next three years because we're fighting the deep over approval so as kind of along those same lines when this consent decree came out and the EPA and the DEP set these limits if correct right was it MDC who provided the strategy of what we're going to do or did did those agencies tell you you have to build a tunnel you have to fix your <coughs> sewer lines yeah how did that work so and uh, that, and it all started in 2004 as you can remember I wasn't here but 2004 there was a lot of discussion there was a lot there was stakeholder meetings with the Wethersfield Cove and um, and we all our engineering firms and ourselves were working towards uh, developing a quote um, uh, it was called the knee of the curve. It's a specific document that's required by EPA and it's associated with affordability. So it basically says, how much can the community afford, right? What's the best bang for your buck, basically? And that study showed uh, that, that we should be designing to a three month level control. What do we design to? We designed to a one year level control. So as you can imagine, four times larger, right? In addition to that, there was an agreement in 2004, and it's documented, but we've argued about it for a long time, about the elimination to the overflows to the Westfield Cove. And the definition was defined in writing as an 18 year storm. We, one of the our questions and arguments was, well, you said this was gonna, in 2006 and seven, you said this was gonna be a $1.6 billion project, and it, and it was, but here's the difference. We didn't finalize the definition of an, of an elimination to the Wethersfield Cove until we started arguing with Deep about it in 2012. And also, we weren't even aware of the elimination to the North Branch of the Park River until 2007 and eight. So those items, the cost of that to go from an 18 year storm to true elimination, meaning shut off the overflows to the Wethersfield Cove, is approximately $200 million for the Wethersfield Cove. And you can say that the tunnel, and, and Jay mentioned that, that the only reason why we need a tunnel up to the North Branch of the Park River, a $700 million tunnel, is because of those four overflows to the North Branch of the Park River. We can do that by separation without, and Jay mentioned that, we can do all of that without building a tunnel. But that, those two projects, uh, those two issues, really were the difference between what we assumed in 2006 as the total cost of this project and what it became. And then every year after, we, we have three year delay in, in approvals, 3% escalation every year. I don't wanna sound harsh, but prior to 2004, what was MDC's plan to upgrade the infrastructure, all the sewage pipes? Um, you've told us about, 150 year old, you know, hollowed yep. out logs, that kind of thing. Sure. So from my viewpoint, it looks like not much was being done for replacing all these aging pipes until you started analyzing how much water was combining with stormwater. Um, yeah, I, and that's a fair point, um, uh, Councilman. The, the, here's, the, here's the facts, I wasn't here, but the facts are we're trying to do exactly what not what was done in the past. We've been um, trying to uh, tell our towns, you either spend this money today or you're gonna spend the majority of your money anyways on emergency repairs. So we would rather um, $40 million a year in capital investment is about two and a half million dollars in debt service, so a mortgage payment, right? Our, we've done a cost analysis and affordability and we presented it at a number of budget meetings if you do nothing and you and you do nothing you're going to spend about two about the same amount two and a half million dollars of money extra for maintenance uh, re, and these types of repairs if you spend 40 million dollars it, it, it's the same it, you're spending the two and a half million the budget increases by two and a half million either on debt service or emergency repairs and i would say to you um, the mdc can take credit for the fact that we didn't probably do our job in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, explain to our towns, if you don't spend this money, 
you're going to wind up with this $2.6 billion program in, the, in, in 2005. So um, everything we've been talking about in the budget, as you know, there's been a lot of pushback about MDC spending money. Um, in 2006, when we presented this at the last meeting, our debt service was 22%. Our operational expenses on employ employees was was 30 something percent, and now it's switched. Now our debt service is 35 percent, and our and our employees uh, cost of employees is is 20 and 20 percent. So we completely switched them, and it wasn't by accident. We knew that we had to put in new pipe, sewer, and water. But you're absolutely right. Um, that, I want to excuse the saying commissioner. I just came from a, a, a board meeting, but you're absolutely right that. Um, Deputy Mayor, that the, the MDC's job, my job is to tell you the truth and that you've got to spend this money because if you don't, you're just kicking the can down the road. And what we're, we're taking a hard line with deep on, and we probably should have done, and we tried to in the Weathersfield Code, to be fair, we tried to explain um, how, you know, the, 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 um, the, uh, the added expense of the elimination to Weathersfield Code in the North Branch was going to increase the cost. And we weren't successful. And the answer was do it. And we said, okay, we're gonna do it. But um, there's an expense to fixing this pipe and uh, these pipes. And if you don't do it, uh, 10 years from now, someone's gonna be saying, why didn't you do it? Or 20 years from now. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I, I, if the referendum fails and the state grants dry up, or don't materialize, what do you foresee happening and what is your plan for that? So the two, two things are gonna happen. Um, uh, EPA, Boston, the CMOM stuff, then they don't care. So when you have a consent decree, you're dealing with the Justice Department <coughs> in DC and they don't care about funding. They're gonna mandate that we do this work. <coughs> so that means all of that work uh, we're gonna have to do under Avalorum. On the state side, it's a little more politics involved. So you're gonna have the state legislature, if a referendum failed, you're gonna have the state legislature uh, in our towns debating, uh, are we going to force the MDC to spend another billion dollars when the referendum pa did not pass? That's, be, that's gonna be an interesting question, uh, whether or not the state actually forces, deep forces MDC to go forward with another billion dollars, even though the referendum failed? I don't know the answer to that. Councilwoman Bell. Um, so if I'm reading uh, slide 24 right, just to be clear, um, current tax bills that residents are paying, I'm, I'm just looking at this, we have 625 is what's shown in 2019, that's ad valorem and your clean water project charge. So the blue piece is the clean water project charge. Yep. And the green piece is the Avalorum piece for a to average residence in Weathersfield. So that's 2019. That was the real number. Okay. So within 10 years, that's going to double, regardless of the scenario we choose. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. So our ta our water bill will double in well, 10 years, regardless the water, of the know. scenario. Well, I was looking at 2030 is, yeah. is And that's our double. point. Our point is um, what, what happened in 2006 and, and 12 when the referendums uh, passed, you, you know, by more than 75%, we weren't paying for it, right? The, the clean water surcharge didn't get implemented until 2008, and it was 50 cents, and it went up 50 cents every year. It wasn't until 2012, and we know this because of our records of water consumption, it wasn't until 2012 when people started to really say, oh my God, what is this on my bill? Well, it's exactly what they voted for. It's the clean, clean water. water surcharge. And um, so you're right. I mean, even if we get, that's my point. Even if we get exactly what we asked for and exactly the grant and loan that we expect, you're still talking about uh, this clean water surcharge peaking out at about $7.50, give or take, uh, by 2026, 2028, uh, all depends on the approval process. But it will it will double from where it is today. But without the grant, it triples. 
And, and, and the important point of this is, and this is an important point for our councils, our legislators to make to deep. Who else, what other towns in the, in, in, in the communities of the state of Connecticut have already spent $1.7 billion? Boston, I've said this before, they spent $500 million on their, on their clean water project. Uh, Springfield, $200 million. No one in New England has spent $1.7 billion, and yet the state of Connecticut can't give the MDC extra time to spread this project out over a longer period of time so we can fix the pipes in the, uh, in the streets of our towns rather than building tunnels that really only help a very small segment and very specific locations within the sewer system. It doesn't help the day-to-day -day people on Randy, Randy Lane, right? Randy Lane. So those are the things that we're trying to do. We're trying to fix the Randy Lanes of the world um, versus just catch a bunch of stormwater. Uh, and I, in my email that I sent out, this is another very important point. We spent $1.7 billion to date. Only $400 million of that is to fix up old pipes. The other money, the rest of it, 1.2 or whatever that math is, uh, was used to increase the size of our treatment plant. Our treatment plant is now sized for 200 million gallons per day. We only drink and use 45. We only receive on a dry day 45 million gallons of raw sewage to the plant. But yet we had to build a 200 million gallon per day plant. That means you have to operate that every day. You have to pay for the power every day, whether you use it or not. There's was the that added, an EPA requirement? That was, uh, no, the state of Connecticut. It's, well, it's, it's, it com the plants become uh, a combination of EPA and DEEP. Um, it, but uh, but it's, it's, as we talked about this in our earlier presentations in the early 2000s, they, the DEEP and EPA say, you must do this by certain, it's not just what you have to do, it's how long you, they give you to do it. So you say, okay, what's the best way to do this? Well, I know I can, um, I can increase the capacity of the system if I make the bathtub bigger. The bathtub is the plant. So if I make the bathtub bigger, then I won't overflow uh, um, and, I, and I build capacity. Then you're building tunnels to collect overflows. Then you're lining. So there's like five components that we're trying to quickly address an issue. But if the state of Connecticut said, MDC, we're going to give you 100 years. This took 100 years to, to create this problem. We're going to give you 100 years. We wouldn't be building a 200 million uh, uh, gallon per day treatment plant. That was $650 million. $650 million at, for 50 times a year. That's, we don't want to make that mistake. And um, again, and so we're pushing back hard and we're asking our towns to help us do that. So once a week you do have or, or on average because you said 50 times a year right. you do require that kind of a size facility uh, it, 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 not uh, yes not except 200. not all, not all 200 but we, uh, we always say that in yep. hartford and downtown hartford is 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 bad i mean a, a, we always say a quarter of an inch of rain and you will have overflows in hartford um uh but but it, 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 it varies based on the amount of rain. But sure. you're, you're having basically wet weather conditions 50 times a year. Can I add one thing? Yes. And then, oh, go ahead. One other point is the wet weather generated by Windsor, Newington, West Hartford, uh, the portion of Weathersfield and Bloomfield that go to the Hartford plant, they exceed the capacity of the plant itself. So you're not even talking about just Hartford, the combined system. This isn't just a Hartford problem. Sure. So it's, it's, the, it's the other pipes too. But you can't get that. So if you size a plant to 200 MGD, and I used, if anybody remembers the, uh, the, the chaos in West Hartford at Lindbrook Street uh, this past um, fall, 2008. I think it was 2018. Um, we're building a tunnel to West Hartford, and it's going to pick up the overflows at Troutbrook. But it would not have solved that problem because it's too far away. It, the, the t that's the problem with the regulators. All they care about is catching that, that SSO or that CSO that discharges to a certain point in a river or a stream. That's all they care about. The, and that's all the money that we're spending is to do, is to catch this overflow. But to fix the real problems in Randy, uh, uh, Randy Lane, right? Mm -hmm. Randy Lane? Mm -hmm. um, 
that that was something we planned to not do until very late in the project. And we said, that's like the poster child of the problem with the Clean Water Project. And we 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 um, escalated the the, uh, the schedule on that project, and we actually addressed a real issue um, on Randy Lane with with overflows. Almost everybody on Randy Lane had uh, ejection pumps, grinder pumps, to just get their water out of their their house, the sewer out of their house um, during a rainstorm. So we're just trying to not make the same mistakes. We didn't have the political support to push back from deep, um, and and to be fair. The integrated plan didn't get approved and get any traction um, nationally until really after 2012, which is after we submitted. But now that Congress passed integrated planning is, is now part of the Clean Water Act. Now, we've, you've probably seen my letters to the state of Connecticut and to EPA. We're mandating that they abide by the Congress, that you must consider it. We have much more than just CSOs to worry about. So when do you expect to hear a decision from DEP? When, you know? We've had some very good meetings in the last month, and we're, uh, Jay, you wanna? Yeah, I mean, I, I think our meetings to date have been with engineering staff. Um, I think we're pretty close to coming to an agreement uh, between the engineering staff and the district, but then uh, the engineering staff is gonna have to meet with deep management and also some environmental groups because some of their decisions may change some of the schedules. So this um, is not a process that we can expect to be wrapped up in the next month or so. This is going oh, certainly to- Certainly not in the next month. We're hopeful that's within the, by the middle of the year or early summer, um, but that's hope. I mean, that's, that's not, we don't, we don't know. It's not completely in our control. In Weathersfield and West Hartford are the two towns that have not um, signed on to the right. integrated plan at this time. That's is right. that right? And have you met with West Hartford already? Uh, we have a number of times, but we're meeting with them again uh, on the 13th of February. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Bellow. Anything else? Um, kind of to piggyback off of um, those comments, right now you talked about a $1.7 billion all in right now. 600 or so of it was the treatment plant. Treatment plant. How much of it is the um, the Big tunnel from oh, Elmwood. 600 million. 600 million. And we're close to, that's, how long has that project been going on? Uh, we started in 2018. Uh, we'll, be, uh, uh, we'll be complete with everything. The tunnel, the pump station. Now we have to pump the water up to the plant. So that's power, energy, uh, by 2023. 2023. And then if the integrated plan does not come to fruition, and you guys have to start building that $200 million tunnel? Is it 200 no, or 700? No, it'll be six, 700 million. 700 million, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, $700 million tunnel from the north end down. Right. Um, I forget which slide it is, but if you want to bring it uh, yeah, up. Yeah, we've got it. Uh, it's not a very great s slide. Yeah, it's the side-by-side -side yeah, comparison. Yeah, yep. Um, what's the, you know, for lack of a better term, drop dead time for that to... Uh, Get that so, thing going. Um, this is all, all of this data that you see here is part of our, uh, our integrated plan that was submitted in December of 18. And Scott, actually, I'm sorry. Can oh, I get you back up there? And uh, so we are, we are wait we're just waiting approval. And uh, uh, we've given, uh, as Jay mentioned, much more detail than this, but we're waiting for their review and approval. Um, I, I do think um, that DEEP is concerned uh, they are aware. We've been very public. Uh, we've been very uh, proactive in, in, in educating the public in our towns about the integrated plan and the cost um, of continuing on with the tunnel concept. Um, so I, I, I believe they're going to approve it. I, I don't think they're going to be able to agree to the 40 years that we've asked for. And what I've said to them is, well, if they give us, pick a number, 25 years, we're going to redo the, all of these numbers will change. The affordability will all change. And we're not going to support something that isn't um, what we have proposed. Uh, we can't because we know, uh, we didn't even talk about this, but the, there's, there's, there's guidelines that are dictated by affordability through EPA, and it basically says, uh, your sewer service to a customer should not exceed 2% of the median household income. So we're at 2% in Hartford, 
and uh, if we continue on with this path with the proposed plan will exceed 2% in a number of other towns. So our position is we're not going to exceed that 2%. And that's just sewer. That's water. Sewer out. and the clean water project. So it would be combined, right? Yeah, total yeah. sewer cost. So, yeah, total sewer cost. So it includes the Avalorum and it includes that uh, clean water surcharge piece. All, my, all water going out, though. Not, not water coming in. Not water right. coming in. Yep. Okay. Which would, we're over 2% now when. Right. And, and it's, not, it's not getting any better. And uh, like, like we've said to DEEP and we've said to our towns, our commissioners, anyone who will listen, it's, it's really not fair that the MDC has been held to a higher standard than any other town in the state. Bridgeport and New Haven, and I would use them as, the, as, as similar to Hartford, they have consent orders, but they haven't been forced to spend the amount of money at the rate that we're spending it. And as one of my emails I mentioned uh, in the letter we sent to Deep, we've averaged over 13 years $119 million a year. I mean, there's nobody in New England that has done that. And enough, isn't that enough? I mean, is, we, as Jay showed in the slides, we've cut uh, our mandate from EPA and Deep was to eliminate a billion gallons of overflows in an average year, we're more than half. And, and our communities need a break. They need a break. But we need the support of the towns because DEEP and EPA don't care about how much it costs. They really don't. And uh, we don't have um, any flexibility with the EPA and the federal government, but we are going to have political uh, um, flexibility with the state of Connecticut. Good luck on that. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you. Yes. We do appreciate it. Um, right. I mean, you guys uh, do a great job of informing us every time, and uh, you know, we kept it to underneath an hour for yeah. both you and Jay. <laughs> so we do appreciate that. Again, commissioners, thank you for coming. Thank you for working with us on this. Uh, we do appreciate it. Thank you. We are going to ask to come back in the next couple of months. We do have the Avalorum study. As you know, we were doing the Avalorum study. There was some uh, concerns about getting rid of Avalorum and using a sewer user charge concept to pay for Avalorum. So we're going to start making our rounds and presenting that study to our towns over the, over the spring and the summer. Okay? Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. Public comments. Yes, sir. Steve, we're, if you want to go, we're okay. It'll take a while. Yeah, it always does. I just found that out. So, I'm Steve Randall, 35 Beverly Road, and uh, I do have to say and ask that in the future, you read your town charter. No, misspoke. Town code, you're not complying with the code of this agenda. This would have been item six on the agenda for a workshop meeting. You can vote to change it, but this is a new council and they haven't voted to change it. So I don't appreciate sitting here for an hour doing things not the code. So I'm here. Actually, if you want to tell us exactly where that would be, <laughs> and we'll have a. Okay. I. Uh, in the code, which is online right below us. And I think it's A18-11, because I looked it up because I knew this would happen. And I saw you snuck in uh, a presentation before a public comment. So actually, you were sent to me that on a purpose, hoping people heard it. It also talks about your five-minute rule, which you haven't applied with in years. Um, so I'm here over good news, actually. 
it, you know, none of us have any control, and it's all waste, so we got to put it somewhere. Weatherfield Cove did a, a while back, a some bunch of people did on. Mr. On Randall, if you could just get a little closer to the microphone. Sure. The Cove Master Plan, 2000. I don't believe it's been uh, redone since then, but, and I don't know how many people have read it, except Kathy here and her team, or wherever, yeah. I would suggest you go through it, because it's, it's an extraordinary document, it's very informative, um, it has a, it's just a tremendous summary of, of where we're at with the Cove in terms of history and where they it suggested we go. And since we're getting ready to go into the budget planning stuff here shortly, I just wanted to give you my perspective on this and you know, assuming I can deal with some of these presentations and they're all done in the correct order, um, I'll bring some other things forward that you can consider between now and April. The key to read in this document though is section nine, that's the objectives. And I'm just gonna reference uh, section 10, which is the conclusion. If you read nine, there's actually pretty pictures. You've gotten some there, those are mine. But the, the conclusions in here talk about Weatherfield must diligently clear unwanted vegetation and grade the shore to discourage erosion, to facilitate regular maintenance and improve water quality. Well, it's just what you were talking about a little bit. And, and I would emphasize this because I don't think we've done a good job of maintaining the cove vegetation over the years. And it talks about maintenance very specifically in here. And if you go through the, uh, the proposed budgets for the last three years, it's really difficult to tell where and how the cove in particular is going to be maintained, where that is coming from, how it's being put in. So I'm asking that we do what we say. And I think we have done quite a bit what we say in the plan, but the main maintenance part. Um, there's a pictures there are just examples of, of some of the problems. We talk about, it's just beautiful, we're gonna, we're gonna have this, we'll be able to go down here, relax, and enjoy the scenery. Well, the scenery, as you can see, in the winter, you can look into the cove in one of those pictures. In the summer, you can't see the cove anymore. Why is that? Well, no maintenance. Very simple, very simple solution. You go in there, you do some weed whacking. The tree guy goes in, the warden goes in and says, cut that one, that one, and that one, and let that one, that one, and that one go. But to me, it sounds simple. And along the edges of the whole west bank, the same thing. It's good. Now would be a perfect time to go in. Next trees, just go in, cut that all down, throw it in the dumpster, and take it out. Do it once every three, four years. Um, there's the other picture in there that shows a, a drain that's been blocked for years. And I'm not talking about anything new here. I have <laughs> been to numerous Parks and Rec committee. Kathy works real hard at this. She puts in work requests. I know I put in work requests. I contact you people directly, maybe not the new council entirely, but previous councils over the years. And I keep putting stuff in. I never get any feedback and I never see any progress. And I just wonder, what the devil are we doing? we're not making any progress against their plans. And these are regular maintenance items. So keep that in mind, please, as you do your budget planning. And also, some of the items, and probably many of the items in here, uh, are related to maintenance. But there's been some capital projects, I call them capital, some big projects that have gotten maybe 75% of the way along, the most recent being the, the new launch that went in. And the, so associated with that, we're coming into planting season and there's still some money left and there's still a need because of safety, traffic, pedestrian traffic, car traffic, to come up with how we're going to pursue the patterns down there, put in some plantings, do soft scaping instead of hard scaping. And I would suggest that that be done, planned and brought to the public now and the various committees rather than later. Simply because planting season starts very soon and trying to plant in that hard pan that's down there is gonna be nigh impossible to get anything to grow. And we already broke the violated, and, you, and we know this because Gary and I have talked, <coughs> we didn't do things in accordance with the approved plans. So now when we go back to do some of the stuff in the plan, such as putting back grass that we took out, 
we we'll probably go in a different area and we may have to go through some other approvals with some other committees in, in town as well as the infamous uh, deep approvals. So you really got to give this some thought and get going, both in terms of what we're trying to do now to maintain it and preserve it, and then what we need to do to finish the activity. Okay. But I do think good progress has been made. But I would recommend you read this study as well as many of the other studies. And one last item, if you're wondering how to pay this, it's very straightforward. Right out of the unapproved budget, the proposed budget. We haven't had an approved budget in how many years? Three, four? No, can't figure that one out. But the Cove, Reserva Cove Preservation Fund, purpose of maintenance, staffing, and improving Weatherfield Cove Park, the whole park. Weatherfield Cove Park, not just the march. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Just one second. We just want to make sure something's connected up here. Uh, anybody else want to speak? Mr. Young? Somebody leave this behind. Carrie, is this yours? Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's yours, Mr. Randall. Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. I didn't come here tonight to talk about the MDC. I had other subjects to talk about. But since the MDC was here, and I did listen for a whole hour on their presentation, uh, I'd like to add a few comments. One, where are they right now? You would think if they were so hell-bent on having a referendum, they would be sitting here listening to what the public has to say. We've seen this time and time again with our public officials. They come in, give their presentation, walk out and expect money from the taxpayers. And that's exactly what we have here tonight. I think we should look at their proposal extremely cautiously, you know, Back, like they said, back in 2004, when they had their first referendum. If I remember correctly, and with my writing is correct, it was $1.6 million. I don't recall hearing about all these tunnels, and I don't recall hearing about all this other stuff that they've been spending money on. We just heard a general whatever, 1.6, and I didn't vote for it. The second time around, they wanted more money. They didn't, I don't remember anymore about how much they were going to do at that point and how much, but I think that was your $2.6 million, billion dollar number. And now they want the 1.7 or somewhere in that neighborhood. I, I, I just look at this as extreme poor management. I also look at this as a monopoly. The MDC being a monopoly of central Connecticut of these towns. And they run exactly like the town of Wethersfield has been running. They don't care what it costs. They're just going to keep taxing us. And whether we like it or not, the bill is going to come in. It wasn't long ago. My bill used to run X amount of dollars every quarter. Then they decided they were going to do it every month. I don't know how much staff up they had to do to collect all those extra fees, those extra checks every month instead of every quarter, but obviously it costs more money to collect on a monthly basis than on a quarterly basis. But of course, now my monthly is what my quarter used to be, and now with the last payment I made, I had to pay another $11 more. So we're going to continue seeing this ramping and ramping up. It goes along with our property taxes. My property taxes went up this year $590. That was 7%. How much, 
how much more is it going to continue going up? I've been here advocating to reduce costs, and that doesn't happen. I would like to talk to these guys who were just here a little while ago about reducing their costs, but they didn't want to hear from me. They didn't want to hear from anybody except for you folks, because you folks have the ability to throw the rest of us under the bus by of, of going along with them. It wasn't long ago our own town council had to budget for the MDC. And what'd they do? They threw us under the bus. That's why I got an extra $11 this month in my bill to pay more. And everybody did. And everybody should never forget that. Because this just continues. And, and they keep working in Harford. I don't care about Harford. Don't care one iota about Harford. What, and why aren't those people in Harford paying the same amount of money that we're paying to flush a toilet? Because their tax gross ink that the taxable income, or what is, I forget what word it is, but uh, they come up with a gross uh, amount of money for, for taxable, the taxable amount. It's, it's, it's 0.32%. We're at 0.70%. And because of that, we pay the lion's share. They have all the work that needs to be done in their community. Yet, they get the ride of, on, on, a, on, on a nice, easier going than what we do. We have to pay for everything. You know, the chairman or whatever, Mr. Jellison or whatever his name was, he says that he's here to tell us the truth. I don't know how he can even say those words. I mean, I was kind of like, holy crap. This, this whole organization's been lying to us. They haven't been telling us the truth. It's just like the town of Wethersfield. They don't tell us the truth either. I hope the new administration does. But the last ones that we had lied through their teeth to us. And our tax bills went sky high, at least mine did. Maybe I'm the only one in town that's tax went up. But Mr. we Young. need to say no. Yep. We need to say no to the MDC. And, and I don't understand why these other towns don't say no. We weren't part of the deal. We didn't make the deal. We don't even know who made the deal. I think it was Richard Blumenthal that made the deal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else willing to speak? Mr. Carruth? Uh, good evening. Uh, Rocky Krug, 149 Broad Street. Um, uh, I, uh, I don't usually agree with uh, Robert, but uh, I was listening to what he says. Uh, uh, we should say no to MDC, and we have been. And uh, I remember back when we had the, uh, the Cove, and they were coming up with all these plans, like these these uh, holding tanks, and and it was it was a contentious time, and and they were not really friendly toward us, and we didn't really like them, and you know we got a plan, and then we had uh, the the idea that uh, uh, oh we got to pay for Harford because Harford can't pay, and then and they said well that was in the contract we have to follow it, but we didn't like that idea either. We kind of said no, and what happened? They took Harford. Uh, out that we don't have to pay. I guess uh, there's a bill, uh, the state uh, uh, had a bill to take, that they would cover Harford, uh, from, what I, from what I'm aware of. So, so we didn't agree to that. And now we got this new plan that was costing us a fortune, and I've been to some of these meetings and I've heard some of you agree that it's not affordable. Well, it's, it's just too much money. It's making this Harford region un, unappealing. You know, you could just go down the street to another town and, and you'll pay much less. You won't have all the roads being torn apart for the next, I don't know, how many, 20 years? I don't know how long, probably like 40 years. And it, it's, it's, it's not really uh, appealing for our, our town, but, but, but I always recommended to, like I've heard them say, to extend the timeline so that we can afford it. And now I heard when I was watching on TV that they said there are some other towns that were treated more uh, fairly than we have as far as, like they mentioned Bridgeport, how, how, how the DEP is, is sort of like forcing us to, us, the community, to pay more 
and for them to see to do more, and I, I don't think that's fair. So I, I agree, we should say no and, and fight it like West Hartford is because uh, other things can be done as we saw with taking Hartford out of our, our, our uh, out of the, uh, out of our responsibility to pay cover if they can't cover. So there are always options. So, you know, the, we, you talked about grants and running out, but you know, I, I believe we should put some more pressure on the state, our, our state legislators, because I think they could do more. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, I don't believe we have any hearings or ordinances. Um, reports from boards <coughs> and commissions. Councilman. I just have to report that recently it was announced that Leslie Civitello from the Chamber of Commerce has submitted her resignation. So the Chamber of Commerce will be looking for a new executive director okay. at a point in the near future. Great, thank you. Deputy Mayor. Just a little update. Uh, Capital Improvements Advisory Committee has been meeting each week. They're tasked with uh, coming up with a five-year spending plan we have virtually hundreds of millions of dollars worth of projects and we have about a million dollars to work with. So they uh, <clears throat> have the task of trying to prioritize those items which they've done uh, preliminary and uh, within the next week or so they'll try and wrap that up and be able to present that to uh, council for part of the budget. But we're looking at spending roughly a million dollars on capital improvements. Okay, thank you. Councilwoman Bella. I attended the library board meeting last week. Um, Howard Greenblatt was there as a member of the Hunger Action um, Team, and they're interested in partnering with the library and the Keene Foundation to offer um, some employment services. Uh, the partnership with the library would be for the library space. The, um, so part of the money would come from food share and the money would be um, if it's awarded, if the grant is awarded, and it would be run through the Keene Foundation. So it would be a partnership um, between the three. The library is um, considering it. They had a few questions they wanted um, Brooke to answer and then that, then that would be a go. Um, also, we talked about um, the library's capital improvement program. Uh, they said that their cooling tower is being installed over President's Day, and now there's going to be a discussion on the chiller. Is that right, Deputy Mayor? Yes. Um, you know, exciting stuff, but we need to get our, we need to keep our air conditioning going. Um, they did lose a teen librarian. She is taking another position, so they will be looking to fill that full-time position in the near future, and they are starting their, um, their budget process as well. So those are the highlights from the library board. Great, thank you. Um, yes, they do need the, a chilling tower and we are looking at it. It's, it's exciting stuff. Exciting stuff, yes. it's expensive, but exciting <laughs> yeah. at the same time. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay, thanks. Um, we do have a, a discussion item up here uh, today and uh, town manager and I were talking about this earlier um, in a um, step to be more transparent I guess um, we did receive this letter I think I shared it with uh, members of the council and if not uh, um, town manager had shared it as well um, we're working right now or at least we're hearing from Mira our um, municipal uh, solid waste uh, folks about their future and how you know they're going to be handling um, municipal waste as it uh, relates to um, their aging facility in the uh, South Meadows. Um, I think the, the town manager has some comments about the uh, the letter, and then I'm going to open it up to uh, you know a full discussion for the uh, the council to uh, to weigh in on. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, and uh, Mayor, I'll echo your comments. The idea is to make this process as transparent as as possible, and to allow the residents. <clears throat> to know uh, the conversations that are currently taking place because this is a large sum of money um, potentially entering the 
town into a contract that could last up to 30 years. Uh, it's a very preliminary discussion. Uh, the mayor, deputy mayor, and Councillor Parker, I don't think anyone else was there, uh, able to attend, uh, did attend a meeting with the Materials Innovation and Recycling Authority, also known as MIRA, uh, to discuss some of the things that were happening there. Essentially, Connecticut uh, legislature approved uh, or is making a requirement that MIRA upgrades uh, their existing site and their existing facility. It needs an extensive refurbishing uh, to the tune of somewhere around $330 million. Um, as part of that process, the state went out to bid um, and there was a, a determined uh, contractor to do the development and again, that's where the price came up with $330 million. Um, before they can move forward, uh, that type of money would require bonding, would require MIRA to bond to access those funds. It is a lot of money. There's a number of towns associated. So MIRA is going out and trying to do a non-binding agreement with the towns to see if there would be interest in entering into what would be a, for a 30-year bond, a 30-year agreement to repay the $330 million. This is a very preliminary conversation. Um, there's a lot of research that still needs to be done, whether or not MIRA retains or continues to be our facility um, that we work with. I know uh, some research is being done internally, not only by staff. Um, I know uh, counselors have been uh, looking and asking as well. Um, so really this is, the idea is to bring this to the council for discussion purposes. I don't expect to the, there to be a lot of dialogue available tonight because I don't have a lot of information to go off of, to give you, to direct you. Um, I do have my own concerns. $330 million is a lot. Um, that relates to a tipping fee if for, uh, for those, uh, just a quick refresher. Uh, the town pays a fee to have uh, one, our trash and recycling picked up, that's one cost, and then a fee to actually dispose of it. Um, and they're talking about currently we're paying $83 per ton. The tipping fee could go as high as $145 per ton. Um, considerable increase um, and impact to our budget. So uh, we're not taking this lightly. And to me, a 30-year agreement always concerns me because it's, uh, it would give us a non-opt-out provision at this point, which means 10 years down the road, they increase the fee past what they said that it was going to be. We're stuck. Um, we've committed to them. So... Um, again, this is for discussion purposes. I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Again, I'm not going to have a lot of information, but I will take them back. The agreement, the document that I have to fill out and return would allow me to ask them questions prior to accepting it. In other words, if you guys said we have no interest in doing that, I'd ask you why, and we'd come up with a list of reasons, and we'd send it in to them for an opportunity for them to explain further. Great. Thank you. Any questions? Councilwoman Bello. Um, Gary, not sure if you know the answer off the top of your head, but what is the, like a general percentage increase year over year? You know, you're saying it's $83 a ton this year. What was it last year? Was it 70 or 70, was it? Yeah, low 70s. So you're 72. talking, you're talking like $10 per ton increase in one year? Correct. But part of that and I keep looking out to Sally because I don't know if she knows the answer, but part of that fee... Sorry to put you on the spot. Part of, part of that cost is based off of they had uh, issues with their facilities, so they right. had... Right, mm -hmm. uh, Something was offline, so they couldn't manage the same amount, so there was a cost yeah. built in there. So Either I, way, we're absorbing that cost. Right, right. I'm just, look, I'm just trying to understand a jump, you know, from 83 potentially to 145 within a five-year period. I guess I'd like to see what did it look like five years ago. Was it the same type of a percentage jump? Um, yeah, I, I see Brooks is shaking his head. It's been very flat until recently. Until recent, right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. and part flat. of the um, sixty-eight dollars, seventy dollars yeah. for years. Okay, and then my other question is: um, I'm not an attorney, but it's a non-binding, non. What is this? Non-binding informational statement of interest. So, in theory, we could sign this letter saying, "Yes, we agree to these terms. Yes, we agree to." 30-year 30 30 agreement at these terms, and then it's non-binding, we can change our mind? At this point, at because this they're point. trying to gauge if the 17 S municipalities on board. It says uh, 70. Or, or, or 70. Seven, 70. Oh, this, yeah, 71. Okay. Dyslexia. Um, the, uh, if, they, if they don't have the high percentage of individuals to do it, even for the non-binding, 
Mm -hmm. They have to head in a different direction. Um, I always have concerns signing something, even if it says non-binding, until I have all the information in place. Well, that, that, that's how I feel. I think, um, I think a 30-year term is an extensive term. Um, who knows what, um, what new or innovative ways of disposing of trash could come up in the next 30 years? Um, so I have a concern with the length of the agreement. And then um, listening to Brooks with his knowledge of, um, you know, kind of increases in tipping fees over the last several years, I think, um, again, a jump from 83 to 145 a ton is, is a lot. And this is something that we grapple with every year when we're building our budgets, that we need to be um, thoughtful of our taxpayers. And these are, the, these are the types of things, these are the costs that inflate budgets year after year. So um, I would have a concern with such a large increase and with the duration of it personally. Thank you. Deputy Mayor? So I think the letter gives us some options of uh, stating what we would agree to. So we can, we could uh, provide them with this statement of interest. However, we would only be interested if for say, it's a 10 year program or 15 year program. And we would only be interested if it's under $100 a, a ton uh, tipping fees. Or, you know, we could put whatever we want. Mm -hmm. And they're going to, I can't believe they're going to get 71 towns to say, sure, we'll sign up for 30 years, $145, no problem. So I think they're, they're going to try and gauge what, what they get back and figure out what they can sell. Councilwoman Peltier. I, as opposed to, I mean, aside from the cost and duration, which I think we can all agree is, is, is a non-starter, the, am I correct that they intend to basically rebuild or completely refurbish the trash burning plant in its current location in Hartford on the riverfront there? And I live in n Old Weathersfield, the northern part near the cove, and I can smell the trash being burned from my house many mornings and <laughs> in, in the early Every morning. morning. <laughs> it's really, it, it makes me wonder about the environmental impact on our town, especially residents who sure. live in that area. And, and it's really nasty for those of you who haven't smelled or don't live in that area. Um, and I question you know, whether it should even be done at all, even if it was for the right price, because it seems like it's an older technology. I, you know, I, I think that there'll be technological advancements that, it, and then I, I know that it would be cheaper just to ship at this point, just to ship the trash out of state. And I would also be curious to see what other towns who are not part of this, you know, part of Mira, how, you know, how, what they're doing and to explore other options. Thank you. Councilman. Uh, Gary, I don't know if you, what exactly did the legislature mandate? Because um, the, the letter says it's been directed by the Connecticut legislature. Is there, was there a specific legislation that, you know, the, the you know, Mira has been mandated to redevelop or I'm just trying to see what their, uh, you know, what, what exactly they have, they have to do. What the mandate was, I'd, I'd have to research that. I don't want to uh, speak out of turn okay. on it, but I can Do you find want me that. to answer, Gary? What's that? Do you, want me to answer Do you have it? Yeah. Yep. They were <coughs> required by DEEP to, DEEP did an RFP to refurbish the plant and selected the preferred vendor. So I personally think it's a very flawed process. I don't support it. It's akin to having the town get three quotes for your roof and then telling you who's gonna do your roof and then they say, good luck. That's what happened with Mira. So in Mira's defense, had very little input, but they were, they were basically, the plant has failed and it will <coughs> fail in the next two or three years. And if nothing is done for the remainder of our contract, they would act as a transfer station and ship the waste out of state till 2027. That's when our agreement expires. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, and to that point, um, we did previously sign a 15-year agreement, which I don't know if that's more palatable to the 
the group, right? So if I push back, is it we'd accept a 20 year with stipulations that you know you won't increase more than X percent per year. Um, those are the types of things that would be helpful for me in terms of direction. Mm -hmm. I, I would be concerned even with that just given that we don't know what else might be out there. I wouldn't want to lock into 20 years. Okay. I, I just have a question that, uh, Brooks, you might have the answer. So you said we're already locked in until 2027 with Mira. So the, if the plant fails in a couple years, we are still obligated to just, they're going to take care of it, and That's however correct. they take care of it. So we're, so is this a plan that will, so they would want to start on this presumably sooner rather than later, and and then we will be signing a new 30-year agreement or however long the period is, whatever it ends up being, from 2027 or just as of, you know, next year, whenever the agreement gets finalized. Or does anyone know? We that? don't, we're not obligated beyond 2027 to utilize Mira. There are towns when CRA project completed in 2011, 2012, that went their own way. They have individual agreements with waste disposal facilities and our you know, contractors, <coughs> West Hartford, East mm -hmm. Hartford. They're not part of MIRA as it is today. So it's certainly an option for Weathersfield to consider. Um, the upside to bundling with other towns is usually you get a better price per ton. Um, that was some of the logic in, in forming the Central Connecticut Solid Waste Authority was to get a better price per ton, which those that participated, I believe, did, and they also got stability. But with the plants just age and just need of maintenance, it's not unlike, it seems like the MDC. Okay. Um, in, the, in their defense, that was a power plant from the 30s that was retrofitted in the 80s to do what it's done. I mean, it really has reached the end of its useful yeah, life. It's there. So, and I think that it was maintained properly. It's just like, again, back to the roof. You know, you get the 35 year shingles, maybe you get 40, 45, but at some point you're gonna do the roof again. And that's where that plant is. And my understanding is there's a lot of plants across the nation that are hitting that same issue. Um, so the question is, are we gonna be limited to where we can go? Is this just, it's just a matter of time. Um, we can do, the research necessary to figure out is it cheaper, is there cost savings for us to go out, is there cost savings for us to keep it in? Um, they did say they would commit until 2027. I think there is probably some increase associated with it uh, per ton, but not to 145, right. which their, is concerning. Their term is net cost operations. Net, so right. they, would, they would, in essence, if they didn't run the plant, would go out of state with the waste and we feel confident that the tip fee is roughly $95, $95 a ton to do that. So you'd be looking at a tip fee in that neighborhood, give or take you know, a few dollars maybe at this time. And we're, but we wouldn't be locked into a guarantee of 95 until 2027. It would be market a market rate type of thing for, for that. Until 2027, we are, we are supposed to pay their net cost of operations right. per ton. And that also is with an important caveat with zero dollar per ton recycling. Many municipalities, if you read the articles, that don't participate in, in this project are now paying to process recycling. Um, we are not, we pay nothing. So one could argue our tip fee is probably a little bit higher than normal just so we have zero dollars per ton recycling. But either way, you're gonna pay. And certainly, unless things were to change in the next few years, I would expect that this is also, again, is a proposal for zero dollars a ton recycling. So maybe one of the comments is, you know, the, the tip fee at 145 is obviously artificially high to maintain a zero dollar per ton recycling tip fee. So maybe they need to go back to the drawing board on that one and, and get a little more realistic with what it, what it truly costs, where you would see the trash fee go lower, but you would see an increase in recycling. So Mayor, could we ask the town manager then to look at West Hartford and East Hartford and see how they're disposing of waste at this time and what the cost might be and if that's something that we would entertain. Mm -hmm. That's exactly why we, uh, we put this on the agenda. Um, just to be ahead of it, you know, uh, I guess much akin to what MDC had presented to us. I guess if we knew prior to 2004, you know, where they would be, 16 years later with, uh, you know, 
seven billion dollars and you know work that's half done, um, but the cost being borne by ratepayers here in Weathersfield, you know, we're doing the same thing just to kind of get ahead of it. So anything that we can look at, be it West Hartford, East Hartford, their private you know vendors that they're working with rather than with Mira, is a uh, is an idea that maybe we can go with. Um, I will say that you know sit also like MDC sitting in that meeting the other day um, at the Capitol, Emira is asking the legislature for help with this. Um, you know, if the legislature in their infinite win wisdom decides to help uh, bringing that trash to energy facility more up to a 21st century standard, um, then that tipping fee would be less than $145 if we do get help from um, the state on that. Um, but again, it's a big ask by Mira to the legislature, and uh, obviously we can't, you know, rely on that right now. But uh, you know, there are ongoing conversations with the legislature to handle that right now. So, just one final question: and if any uh, current towns peel off and go their own separate way, will that obviously a, they're no longer in that service area? There's no cost of service there, but will that I assume increase the tipping fees moving forward for them. I mean, how, how do they reconcile that? I'm sure that they an increase to the you know remaining you gotta, communities. I mean, not every single one of these communities is in the same sure. fiscal situation that we're in, and as they read a 330 get a 330 million dollar letter in the mail, um, you got to think that many are in the same situation and are considering peeling off. Mm -hmm. Yep, <coughs> and I guess that would be one question. We could ask Mira, you know, if, if that 71, and I, I don't believe the full 71 signed on to that 15 year back in 2012, if I'm no, not I mistaken. It's about 50. 50 right now. Right. Yeah. So there's only about 50. But again, you know, if there's 71 in there, 50 of them are signed on to the 15 year. If you know, half a dozen to a dozen, right, yeah, yeah right. start peeling off, you know, what would that additional cost be? Um, and would it be borne by you know those remaining towns that are in the uh, um, the new contract? Yep. Yeah, we can definitely look into that. Thank you. Um, there's really no action that's needed on this other than you know our town manager going forward with some of these questions, <coughs> and then you know taking your input today and, and putting it into writing on the letter back to them. Uh, I don't but believe it's due until the end of the month. Yeah, but are we agreeing that we're not in f support of? of a non-binding informational statement of interest? I mean, we don't have, I, I don't know if you want to, we don't have, I'm not saying we need to take a motion, but I mean, do we agree that we are not in favor of this non-binding informational statement of interest? Yeah, I mean, I think we'll, we can discuss in the next couple weeks, next couple we'll bring days. Bring it back to the next council meeting? Exactly. Fantastic. Yep, yep. Okay, we do have until you. the 28th to, uh, to decide on that. Um, and there are, there's a number of questions and a lot of um, unanswered questions um, to look into right now. Yep. Oh, I just wanted to Sorry. say, like, in this non-binding informational statement of interest, I mean, it, ex <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it says, you know, you know, are you interested in participation? Yes or no? If no, what terms would be satisfactory? So I think we all agree would say no. No. Yes. Right. <laughs> and Everyone then agrees we can we're list some no. of these <laughs> issues we've addressed or we've brought up. Right. So. But I don't even think we've agreed on terms. And no, that's you a know, different question. And, and the that's um, also um, no. Oh, right. yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 They asked a lot of that. And <laughs> it's a $330 million bill. And you want to. Yeah, in a 30 year. I yeah. mean, no, we don't I'll want to give you, you two know. lines. Right. 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 <laughs> right. <Yeah>. See addendum. <laughs> Pages X, Y, and Z. OK. <laughs> yes, thank you for those questions, and uh, yeah, we'll definitely take those concerns and comments um, into consideration. Um, moving on to council action, uh, there is a uh, clean diesel uh, grant that is before us. Um, I don't know, so I see Sally back there and uh, the town manager um, prepared to talk about it. Thank you, Mayor and Council. First, I'd like to start off and just make a correction, and I greatly apologize for this typographical error. Under the item, we talk about the request to seek a grant toward the purchase of a large dump truck. That is true. Purchase cost of the vehicle is, um, we're really estimating it's supposed to be 212000 
and that should read the town's portion of the purchase price is, and we're estimating 170,000. We're basing that off of, um, we receive a credit when we take the current non-compliant vehicle offline um, and so we receive a credit. So we're estimating around $48,000, $50,000 in savings. I apologize, I um, kind of mixed up the numbers or messed up, uh, right. and I, and inappropriately reported the numbers. And let me just jump in real quick. This is a workshop item for referral to a regular meeting. So th there's no vote to be taken on final action tonight. This is what we're just gonna hear um from sally and physical services and town manager on this um, grant for um the uh, the clean diesel to be put towards i guess the dump truck correct so we're looking and i'll i'll give it up to sally for a second because i know she's just dying to talk about the subject <laughs> yeah. um but th this is for consideration for the regular meeting uh it is a grant to purchase a truck to replace a 2006 sterling vehicle um the new truck would be a clean diesel which reduces diesel emission and it's to replace one that is non-compliant, also not <coughs> as efficient, and also having uh, difficulty uh, maintaining it from a uh, mechanical standpoint. And I'm happy to answer any questions, or Sally's here if you need me to go further. This grant that we are looking to potentially get is once again part of the Volkswagen Settlement uh, Grant through the EPA. In the past, um, these types of grants, we have been very fortunate in that Weathersfield has received these funds. And so we are pretty confident that if we go for it, that we would get it. Um, some of you may feel like it's deja vu all over again. This uh, particular truck that we are looking to replace is a vehicle that we had discussed last year. Physical services, is that we provide services to the town. That is, that is what we do, that is why we're here. And in order to do those services, in order to plow, pick up leaves, fill potholes, haul materials, work in the transfer station, create mulch up at the stockpile, create the stockpile, haul materials, we need vehicles to do that. The vehicles are our tools in our toolbox. They aren't toys, as some people have gotten up here and talked about us wanting you know, the new shiny things. These are the workhorses, these are the tools that we need to do our job. And it is unfortunate, but a reality, that these tools are expensive. And these tools are going up in price every year. The same vehicle last year was less than $200,000, which is still an exorbitant amount of money. But these vehicles have to have what they call the tier four engines and emissions, which is mandated and very expensive because it is basically redesigned these types of trucks. There are new tariffs on parts that go on these trucks. And just if any of you have looked at buying a new car, you will know that the price of cars now are probably what your parents bought their houses for 20 years ago. Um, and it is unfortunate, and it would be great if we could go and find less expensive vehicles to do this work. They're not there. We go to the trade shows, we do our research. These vehicles cost a lot of money, and we can't do our work without them. And we certainly can't do our work as efficiently without the number of them that we need. For example, when we go out and plow, we get calls all the time. We want the trucks to come by quicker, come by quicker. It takes on average right now of a plow driver three hours to do their route. If we lose a truck, then we are expanding the amount of time it takes for the drivers to do their routes. These are workhorses. And in previous times, we've talked about hours and miles. The particular truck that we're talking about now um, has over 50,000 miles on it. You can equate it to a little over 5,000 hours of use. Um, it is, there is no one formula to plug in that says this amount of miles equals this amount of hours or vice versa. A lot of these trucks, when they are doing work, they idle and 
one hour of idle time could be approximately 35 miles. Um, so it, it's back and forth, but this truck that we're looking to replace right now has over 5,000 hours of its, of its usefulness. Part of the problem also with this particular vehicle is that the manufacturer of the vehicle is no longer in existence and hasn't been for over 10 years. The vehicle itself has an engine that was built in 2005 and was put into produ this production vehicle in 2006. It is the only one of that particular brand that we have left in our fleet. It is nearly impossible to find actual parts for it because of the fact that the company went out of business in 2009. And part of the reason why they went out of business was because these trucks were problematic and people stopped buying them because they couldn't get parts, the parts were failing, the trucks were failing. And so when we do have to fix the trucks, we have to do basically a nationwide search for parts of what might have been remaining from when the inventory from 10 years ago was sold off. Third party manufacturers are not making parts for it. And so some things we've fabricated some things we've been lucky enough to be able to find a part, but we've paid for that. We've paid the upcharge for that in order to keep the truck running. There's also some things that we can't stop as much as we want to. We work very hard to wash the trucks, to maintain the trucks, to grease and oil and clean the trucks, but they still rot out after time because of the fact that so much of the time that they're in use is salting and sanding and being in inclement conditions. This truck has rot through its frame and up through the body. And is it gonna fall apart tomorrow? No, but it is like a metastasizing cancer. This rot is spreading. And there will come a time when we just can no longer use this truck. We can use it now, it is safe. Up to, um, from the last time that we've spoken to now, we have spent about $8,000 in parts that we have ourselves have done the work on, on this truck, um, but it's time has come. And we are getting to that point where we have to make either make a commitment to replace it, or we are going to start really seeing the downturn in our, in our equipment uh, replacements because we're elongating the amount of time that we take to replace vehicles and the costs obviously keep going up. And I come to you and ask this, as I said before, because this is the tools of the trade. And we need to provide the services to the town that physical service is there for. And we certainly don't want to be forced into a situation where we have to use outside contractors to do that work, because that's never a good scenario. And so in order to keep our fleet up with our people doing the work, um, one of the we wanted to bring to you to see if um, we can discuss going for this grant because the expectation would be if we were given this grant that we would be purchasing the truck. Okay, thank you. If I may just add, it's for a point of clarification. They're also they're used year round. It's not oh, just for snow plowing. They're the leaf yes. pickup. Leaf pickup, hauling materials, uh, we use them for when we work with engineering, whenever we're doing road projects, road projects right. okay. we use them for filling potholes, we use them for snow plowing, we use them for bringing um, and, and working within the transfer station. Anytime there is, when they do crack sealing, anytime there's any project going on, we are using our trucks, our dump trucks. Even today when there isn't snow, there's other projects that we use them for. Councilwoman Peltier. If we, if we accept this grant, would you be able to sell the truck or does it have to be destroyed? It has to be destroyed. We need to prove it. In the past, what we've done is we have taken videotape of our, of our mechanic literally welding through the frame and have sent that and that has satisfied their knowledge that this is being taken off the road. And just to clarify, the uh, 
approximate amount of the grant? Is it about well, forty-two thousand? Up to up to twenty-five percent of the purchase cost. Oh, okay. Which one is the Gary? Which one is the price? Is the real price the two hundred seven? We're, we're estimating two twelve. I think was the number the price yeah. at the current state contract. Yes. <coughs> Councilwoman Bella. Um, hi, Sally. Thanks hi. for being here tonight. <laughs> I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, how many of the large dump trucks do we currently have, and what are the ages of the other vehicles? The other vehicles. Um, this is the oldest one that we have. Mm -hmm. um, we started really going after a replacement um, in two thousand and seven. And currently, there are nine. So you have nine large dump trucks. It's not, I will double. I will. I will double check my chart. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering how many large dump trucks we have, mm -hmm. and what are the um, what are the ages of them, and are they all the same brand? No, they are not the same brand. S some are Freightliners, some are Internationals. Um, there are mu uh, multiple vendors out there but we also do go off of what is um, being highlighted on the state contracts mm -hmm. for that year that we're buying sure. them. And the, the, um, how we want to have the truck outfitted, which one um, is, is better for that. Okay, and then the other question is, um, we're in the, I know that the capital um, mm -hmm. budget is being, um, drafted now what are some other vehicles that you're asking for or you're thinking of asking for in the upcoming budget would this be your one ask this if approved it would be in next year's budget for physical services our one big ask was this one yes um, we have a couple of other um, items on the CNEF list Mm -hmm. um, and I know that also engineering has an ask and the police department has an ask for vehicles. Um, but for physical services, this is really the one we are going after. Okay. All right. And if you could just let me know how many dump trucks yes, you have. I will. That would be great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Parker. Do you know what the truck would sell for? Um, from a scrap metal... Um, I don't have the exact cost of that. Um, it varies. So you think that the truck's only worth the value of the scrap metal? Yes, at this point. Well, we can't sell it for use because that's the whole part of the grant. So at most, we would we would sell it off at auction. And right, but if you were to not get the grant and sell the truck in working condition, what would be the value? Uh, of a sterling truck, I'd be surprised if any, if very few people would wa would want it, I don't know specifically the answer to that can, question. Can you look but into that for us, please? Yeah, I mean, okay. right now there is not a market. Yeah, there is. Now I know they're all different sizes. Yeah, so I yeah. Exact model. there isn't a market for the Sterlings because people know that they can't replace the Sterlings, um, so they would it would go to auction. Do we have a backup truck? Um, we don't have a backup truck of this size that does that route right now. But you have nine large we dump had, trucks well, in wanna, the fleet. Or we have one. Was there any thought given to purchasing a new truck and keeping this truck as a backup? Um, in previous years, at least since I have been here, we have not added to the fleet. The fleet That's has always idea. been maintained. It's always been a one for one. And there has never, since I have been here, had a discussion about expanding the amount of trucks in the fleet. And again, um, we would have to, if we got the grant and we accepted the grant, we would have to make that truck unroadworthy. It could not be used. Could you, do you know the offhand, the, the model of the Truck, the particular dump truck you're looking to replace? Um, the actual model, no, I do not. I can get that information, but. Okay. But I would say that new trucks, being the price that they are, a 14-year-old vehicle from a manufacturer that is no longer in business with 5,000 hours and 50,000 miles on it, I would be very surprised that it would 
get a significant amount of money now, especially at scrap, because it can't be roadworthy. If, we, if, like I said, if we were to get the grant, or if we were just to sell it outright, people aren't buying something they can't, once it breaks, they're done. And it's also rusting, and you have to take that into consideration when they would do the inspection of the vehicle prior to purchase. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor? So the list that I have here shows two trucks, 2006. Is that accurate? And then the question is, would, did in 2006, did we buy one Sterling and one International or one Freightliner? In 2006. I have, this list shows truck nine yes. and 10 as being 2006. This is a, this list, I will double check. I believe we no longer have that vehicle. Which one? Uh, one of the, I have to double check and see truck 10. Yeah, but I will double check. Okay. Uh, question I have, so I'm not sure exactly, do we have nine or 14 or whatever the number is? Are those trucks out? Every truck is out every day? We use, the major we use the majority of trucks every day. Is every single truck out during winter operations, during snow removal? Yes, we're using all of the trucks. During the summer, sometimes we were able to rotate trucks depending on what types of projects we're doing and how many staff we have doing them. There are some projects where we have multiple people working in one project, so they only need, they don't need to have four trucks and four people like we do in winter operations. If they're working on a road project, we may have a road crew of six people utilizing two trucks. And so there is that rotation. Um, so I can't tell you that every single truck during the, the summer months is out. Certainly during fall and when we are doing the LEAF program, um, all of our dump trucks are in operation. Um. Going back on my notes, if this is the same vehicle as, as uh, the, for the previous grant that was uh, denied, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, it had 49,000 miles on it then. So it looks yeah. like it only has a couple thousand miles since last year where the other trucks seem to run about 5,000 miles a year. So that would lead me to believe that you don't use this Sterling very often. Is that true? Uh, it's not that we don't use it, it's that it hasn't been um, usable in many cases, um, and so we've been rotating it in and out and finding parts for it. As I said, we've done a lot of work accessing those parts and getting the parts and then fixing them has taken those tr that truck off the road for a significant amount of time. Um, so. Yes, they, we've only put a couple of thousand miles on it um, because it just hasn't been as available as the other trucks. So what I know about the Sterling vehicles is Sterling manufactured the truck using components from other manufacturers. This particular truck has a Mercedes diesel in it. I would think those parts are readily available as are brakes, tires, many other components of the truck are manufactured by other than Sterling. Um, I think most of the problems you have sourcing parts are Sterling specific, body parts, uh, things of that nature. So I would think you'd be able to get around that. As long we've, as you keep the vehicle running, I think we're getting our money's worth out of it. We've also been looking at third party parts, even though many of the parts and the third party parts were made by companies that are still in existence, Ford, Mercedes, they're not manufacturing those parts. Um, we also look, we've looked on eBay, we've looked at third party vendors, we've looked at clearing houses. Um, you know, again, it's, it's the diminishing supply of something that is keeping something that's 14 years old up and running. They're just not manufacturing the parts as readily. Um, and again, with diminishing supply come increased costs of getting those parts. 
I would like to see some more data about what the other vehicles cost to maintain on a yearly basis. So some of the items that you had listed on your attachment uh, seem to be routine in nature. I think you had tires, exhaust, uh, PTO pump or whatever. So I think no matter how old the truck is, you're going to start running into those items. Um, and I'd be curious what kind of money we put into each of the other vehicles mm -hmm. to, you know, say a vehicle that's uh, 2012, for example. I doubt that we're running that truck and not spending any money on maintenance. We're not spending any money. I certainly can get you more cost, but I can tell you pretty succinctly that it's not the amount that we're spending on this. Okay, thank you. This may be a question for Gary or even Mike O'Neill. Um, and we're looking to purchase this truck and not bond it or lease it. We typically have we purchased cash up. Right, so uh, the past couple of years we've been going through this question of whether or not you lease versus purchase um, from fiscal conservative standpoint. It's always better to just buy it rather than try to lease it. Um, Rates have been historically low. So for some vehicles, police vehicles last year, I want to make sure it was last year or two years ago, um, there was a determination to lease because it made sense. Um, oh, I know what it was. We switched over with the fire department, with the um, fire marshal's vehicle to purchase. Um, we were looking at trying to go more of a pay as you go versus leasing. Um, frankly, once we do the CNEF budget and we take a look at where the numbers are and what the rates are, I'll have a better, um, a better idea and a better understanding of whether or not fiscally that makes sense to uh, to finance versus purchasing outright. And I do recall this almost a year ago yeah. to the date <laughs> uh, being discussed. We also, mm -hmm. I believe it was last year, um, purchased two additional fire trucks, if I'm not mistaken, that were not purchased outright. That's pre-Gary. Two years ago. I think it was it two was years, two years ago. ago. Yeah. I believe it was two years ago that we did the fire trucks. Okay. But we're st we're still paying those off. Oh, yeah. yeah. Those were a million yeah, dollars. Million yeah. each. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Um, uh, right. Um, okay. No, just right. putting into context yeah. what we have for, mm -hmm. you know, cash flow going out as opposed to coming in right now. Um, kind of looking at uh, a couple other purchases as well. So I would make one comment that though at some point we we do need to um, remember if we if we start to push things out too long we will start to jam things up. I just, you know, I think about my own house. We have lots of drivers at home, we have lots of vehicles and I certainly wouldn't want to get in a position where I had to where I had two cars die and had to buy two new cars because clearly who can afford that? Mm -hmm. um, and to, a, uh, to some extent, we, we'll, we will have to look at that at the town level as well. And I know people talk about the police cruisers and why do we buy five police cruisers every year? We should you know, look, look at that um, replacement schedule and it just, if you put it off too long, you, you do jam up to the point where now you need to buy two dump trucks and now you're talking you know, half a million dollars and, and that isn't, um, there isn't room for that in the, uh, the budget. So I think we do need to think that there is a 25% um, a grant out there that would help us um, to purchase this vehicle. So I'm not saying I'm for or against it, but I think we do all need to look you know, out more than just a year and, and look at all the purchases of vehicles so that we don't continue to push things off to the point where you know, we have to spend a $10 million bond on vehicles or roads or buildings or whatever, you know, there, there is some sense to having some annual expenditures um, and some of them are big tickets just based on what the vehicle does and, and clearly it's not like you're buying a car, you're buying a huge piece of equipment. I mean, I've been in the garage and stood next to them and you don't realize how enormous a, a large true. dump truck is until you're in the bay of the garage and you feel like you're, you know, dwarfed by the size of the vehicle. Um, and I hope we do, I hope you do give new council members a tour of all the facilities 
because I think it is important that they see the equipment in the garage. Mm -hmm. And we went on a really crappy day, and it was yes. slushy, <laughs> and there was salt and all sorts of stuff on the vehicles, and they had the they had yeah. the um, snow plows on them, and it really was a good exercise for new council members um, to see what our what the equipment looks like, yeah. so we, that we have a better sense of what you do and why you're asking for some of these things. Um, I had a large dump truck in front of my house last week, thanks to Mrs. Logan, um, for complaining about a pothole on, yeah. on Hartford <laughs> Avenue. So we did <laughs> see them. So they are out. I, you know, I know firsthand that they're out and about um, performing necessary service to to the town. And also, I would say, you know, <coughs> in about transparency. Also, you know, we <coughs> purchase. Um, vehicles off the state list so anyone can go and take a look at what the, the costs are there are um, cash show runs a show every year where you see these vehicles where you can go and see what the cost of these vehicles are in addition to um, other towns you know who are in the same situation that we are um, and you know trying to not get into a significant deferred maintenance um, issue with their vehicles and so, um, it, again, just looking at the prices of these vehicles um, is, even though it is a big ticket item, anyone is free to, to go out there and research that what pricing we're getting is the best that we can do. I don't think, you know, none of us up here are questioning that. I mean, I, I would imagine that, you know, we do look at, you know, have confidence in departments to, to look at the best interest of uh, taxpayers when it comes to purchasing absolutely um just to reiterate they this truck is safe so we're, yes, we're not yes. jeopardizing anybody no and no. you know and we have very qualified cdl only commercial driver's license only operators operating these trucks who have um significant experience doing that mm -hmm. and then any of the i mean you, you look at brakes so if you, 8350 for total over the past year on a $200,000 truck, you know, simple math shows that it's less than 4%. Yeah, I was going to say. 4% uh, of a $15,000 car is, you know, a couple hundred dollars. So it's comparable to how much you're paying yearly in maintenance um that's it's parts only though we're not, yeah, that doesn't include labor costs. right yes, well, that's yeah. parts that's only on a 15 year old labor intern we do labor on this internally too yes correct? Mm -hmm. yes yeah. it's it's that amount of money on a vehicle that 15 years ago didn't cost two hundred and twelve thousand dollars, and has you know the amortization of it and the, mm -hmm. the decline of it so it's not exactly as if you know that's not four percent of the of a new vehicle um, but I certainly see what you're saying that right. again you know it's do you keep it going for as long and longer as you can and weigh the cost of these vehicles weigh that if we do if we decide if you decide not to purchase it and we wait it will will there be the opportunity for a grant again you know, also trying to find that what ways can we defray and bring down the cost of these? So there's gotcha. always yeah, there's, uh, it, there's always risk. Yep. Yeah, and we got to kind of balance it and measure Absolutely. it out right now. Yeah, and I you. certainly appreciate your time and can openness. Mayor, could we ask um, to get a list of all the vehicles? that you know all the dump trucks that physical services has or maybe all the vehicles they have you know so we can get a sense of a replacement schedule tom you you know there's 14 or 9 or if we could have um you know or 12 or 11 i don't know if we could get um a list of the vehicles and um i don't know if you have a replacement schedule we or do have a, replacement. a priorities list we do have a replacement schedule we are currently now just updating it because we're in preparation for the budget sure so we certainly will get you get yeah. everyone on the council that information i would we like just to see that yeah at the last minute we were i was asked a question and i took the last year's one that i had mm -hmm. but um yeah. as i right. said we are are updating it and so it, you will see how many years out we are from what we had anticipated the date being to replace a number of vehicles we're now in the minus column instead of being ahead okay thank you
Councilman Hill. Um, Sally, just one, one, I'm sorry to belabor this, but no, is, is there a, um, do you use or does the department use like a ratio in terms of how many trucks you need? Like I'm just thinking for snow removal, you need X amount of trucks per ro mile of road or population or it's like, I mean, how does it determine that? nine is the number that we need or 12 or, or, or whatever the way that the town we have a, a map and the town is sectioned off i always use the wrong word which is quadrants which would make you think it's four but there's actually 15 sections of town um, but not every section is the same size becomes because some are more highly uh, dense as far as population and also the width of the roads Weatherfield is very is is unique, of course, in that you know you look at say River Road or Main Street and, or um, extensions off of Main Street are very narrow, windy roads. Then you get Wolcott Hill Road, which is a straight shot, almost double wide, and so we have to utilize different trucks on those roads. Um, and so just over and it's a it's a map which we tweak every year like this year we now have whipper will estates and you know as the subdivisions have grown we've had to provide plowing in through there so that's kind of how we we work it we also try to work each section of town so that is it is on average a three hour loop mm -hmm. for the driver to be able to complete and some i will say depending on the snowfall and depending on the driver some take a little less time, Sim take a little more time. The average is about three hours for that first push. Then it could be a little longer when we're doing curb to curb, but through that, those first initial pushes as we're getting through the snowstorms, um, we try to keep it and we tweak those so that we keep them in the three hour increments. Mayor, if I, I can, just so Sally can, can you explain what you mean for the curb to curb? Just, okay. they might when, not understand the strategy. <laughs> when, there's a, when there's a snowstorm, uh, we go through literally like the center of the road first in order to clear the road for emergency vehicles and for our vehicles so that if an ambulance or a fire truck needs to get through, there is a clear path. Then we go back and we literally clear curb to curb, which is what people are used to when they see the plow trucks going by and they're saying, I just Finished. Your driveway came, I just, just finished my driveway <laughs> and the plow truck came by and I got sprayed. That's a curb to curb clearing. But, and so there's many, so there's a couple different ways that the road is cleared. As I said, that first pass is a make safe to get a vehicle through, then it's a clearing. And then once the storm has ended, because we also, um, people may call it the tree line or the snow shelf, Again, in some parts of Weathersfield, the snow shelf is very small, and so we get a lot of snow buildup, so we have to go back and haul that snow away to clear sight lines to make it safe for vehicular traffic. We also have to haul away snow from places like the high school because there's no place to put snow, or we haul snow away from the town hall parking lot. There are areas where We'll clear it, we'll mound it up, and then we have to go back and get it out in order to create safer uh, traffic patterns for people. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank okay. you. Yeah, yeah it's, I just, as always in municipal government, there's always a method to the madness. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so over years yeah. and years of it. And each path takes three to four hours to yes. do, which was the and also, and that is, point. That is where we, that's for an average snowfall rate per hour. Of, I mean, when you get, when you get a snowstorm that has a um, a heavy 11 inches, it's going to take longer yeah. to clear that curb to curb. Mm -hmm. yep. How's the snow budget? No, please don't oh. say anything. <laughs> Too early. I got to ask. Please. I got asked. Favorite, Thursday night they're expecting yeah. ice. <laughs> my, <laughs> my favorite panic from uh, Sally was this Sunday when she said, "Just to let you know, we're we're uh, we're keeping an eye on the weather because we're expecting to have a certain amount of inches." Um, and the ongoing joke, and this happened last year, was it's always on a Sunday where you're paying double time, double time. <laughs> yeah. to call of someone course. in potentially. <laughs> yes. for um, right now we are um, we're within our budget. Um, we have been very fortunate, as I say, knock yeah, on knock wood on and light candles, um, that <laughs> we haven't had the icing events mm -hmm. and the snow events. Um, but it, 
it's you know February, ask me that question in 10 weeks oh I know and it's usually not till I the know. second week of April that I feel confident mm -hmm. that it's not going to snow anymore because mm -hmm. last year it snowed in April um, but so far which has allowed us to now to these past few weeks to go out and do other maintenance that we had had to defer sure. um, in previous times so we're really taking advantage of the good weather right. thank you thank you well not to belabor it anymore I think we do have a motion on on the table or no we're not on the table no. but oh, I'll, I'll move to refer this matter to the next regular meeting for discussion second motions on the table and second all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. opposed thank nay thank you for your time thank you all right have it motion is made and carried um, we have uh, some resignations deputy mayor I make a motion to accept the resignation of Mark Townsend, 38 McMullen Avenue, from the Human Rights and Relations Commission, term of 121.20 to 630.23. Second. A motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. I'll make a motion to appoint Sandra Willoba to the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, 68 Forest Drive, term of 2320 to 63020. As an alternate, sorry. Yes, and this is only a four month, a little over a four month term. Yes. Second. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. I see uh, Eric and Kathy back there. Um, we've got the uh, Strategic Prevention Framework Grant for Social and Youth Services. <coughs> Thank you for staying nearly two hours. We get to learn about trash to energy, <laughs> water, sewer, and dump trucks. <laughs> A little bit of everything in one evening. Um, we're here tonight to talk about a grant that uh, through the Social and Youth Services Department we found out about recently that it's a federal grant that would allow um, our Social and Youth Service Department to apply for it and um, it's, it came out very quickly and it has a due date of early March so that's why we're here tonight uh, to see if it's something council would like us to move forward with. Um, we have a very short timeline to submit the grant, and it's a very competitive grant, so, um, so we're, we're pushing through with some of the information right now. So we should have answers to your questions, and if not, we can always get back to you. And we're learning about it as we go along, too, but it's a, um, it's a framework grant from the federal government to enhance and support local communities in their initiatives around different um, abuse, behavior, prevention programs, things of that nature that we look at with um, our community and, and people that live in the community today. One of the reasons we, we think we're at least um, want to apply for it is um, this grant is very much data driven. And recently we've done a survey of both the middle school and the high school to get data from the students about their behaviors. And we did one in 2016, and then again just recently in the fall of 2019. So we did a baseline in 16, and now we're, we did it in the fall of 19, and we're just re waiting to get that data. And that will be able to tell us the areas that we're gonna wanna highlight. We have an idea, obviously, of where we wanna work for prevention programs in the community. But this will absolutely help us with the data to go right in the areas that we think are critical to the community. This grant is interesting in that it's a uh, up to $300,000 for, for up to five years. And um, that would look to um, fund some staffing, prevention programs. I'm missing something. Um, staffing prevention data and data collection as we go through the process. 
it would be something we'd be working with our health district on and we'd be um, really looking to bring, bring programs into the community to better the quality of life here with residents. It's kind of a snapshot of what it's about. And we do this through our work with our youth advisory board, which is also the local prevention council for the town of Wethersfield. In the past, we've gotten little local enhancement grants to bring to town $3,000, $5,000. This is a federal grant that um, we're, we want to try for and see if we uh, can be competitive enough to get it. Anything I missed? No, that's good. Okay, thank you. Any questions from councilors? Councilwoman Bella. <laughs> um, so there's no, <clears throat> there's no buy-in, there's no money from the town that has to go in. There's no match for this. Correct. Um, it would just be up to $1.5 million over five years, if I do the math right. Correct. Um, and it can pay for staff and that's it. There's no, no cost to the town for any of this. Okay. No, about the only thing we'd be looking at is if we hired some staff, we'd be uh, putting them, giving them space here in the town hall. Mm -hmm. And also some of our staff would be obviously working on the grant. Right, using staff time yes. for it. And it would be in collaboration with the Central Connecticut Health District? They're in support and we would work with them as well. Okay, and so they have looked at this grant and they are in, in they support are of it. They are aware of it, correct? Okay. They are willing to give a letter of support. Fantastic. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> so this five-year grant to put staff on, are these positions gonna be temporary, tied to the grant? Once the grant money goes away, and individuals hired lose their job, or is this gonna morph into another full-time employee or employees? No, you this would, would they're hired as, as we have the grant. It's, it would only be a grant-funded position. And if so I'm, after five years, the people lose their jobs? We would potentially be looking to inquire um, additional grants as we work with this grant as well. There's some other uh, federal grants um, that are up to 10 years that could sustain it even longer. And if we don't get those grants, the people lose their jobs? Yes, but they're hired knowing that it's a grant-funded opportunity, and, and there are that would be the way the contract would be when the hiring was done. That would be that understanding. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Counselor, if I may, just to that, a lot, it's um, two thoughts. The first is it's not that unique, right, to have a not to exceed to match a grant term. The second component is that uh, the benefit of a multi-year grant like this is that um, it's obviously much harder to find talent who will do a grant that's year to year, which is part of the reason they look at a five-year is they know you have to build capacity. You want people from within um, uh, the community to build the relationships that you need to be successful. So in terms of grantsmanship, um, having a five-year is a great multi, um, a multi-year grant is a great way to, um, to ensure those costs stay flat for, or not flat, but um, to keep someone on board for five years, which allows you to go after additional funding. Deputy Mayor. Uh, my concern is that we bring someone on and then this is how our payroll keeps growing and growing over the years, then we lose that funding. No one wants to be the bad guy and let the person go, so we just have to find money somewhere else to support those positions. And it's, I think in the past that's been the that's been the method is you find a way to continue funding the, the staff that you hired five years ago. Uh, maybe to um, I have a question for the town manager. Um, do you know off the top of your head how many staff we had three years ago versus how many staff we have today? Townwide or in the department? No, town townwide. In your department, I know that answer. <laughs> no, I mean in her department. Um, no, I would. I'm, I want to. I want to see if if um, the deputy mayor's theory holds true. I, I if, don't. If, if we have added. Yeah, I, I don't offhand. I I can talk. Um, I could probably take a few minutes and go through and figure it out based off of conversations that I've had with different department heads. I do know that from a capacity level, we are um, in 
in most departments, we are below capacity because if pe as people have retired, we haven't replaced them. We've absorbed, we've shuffled as, as best we can based off of the skill set that was available within the existing. If we didn't have the skill set, of course, we had to look to replace. But I don't, I don't, I can't say for certain. So could um, you let us know but how many look. employees there were five years ago, three years ago, and then today? I'd right. like to know that so information. So I'll look, I'll look grant funded and not grant funded as well. Just so it's one, three, and five years ago? Yeah. Okay. And some of those positions may not have been, you know, if, if we had just rough numbers, 75 years ago and we're down to 69 right now, that one position may not have been a grant-funded position in the past. There aren't many grant-funded positions in the town. I guess what I, I guess my point is um, to the deputy mayor's comment that the town has actually been very mindful of adding employees and has actually, I believe, done the opposite over the last five years and has reduced our workforce, um, or at, at the very least not added to our workforce. Um, and I just want to see if that holds true because I, I can think of positions. There's a position in finance that wasn't filled. There's a position in the town clerk's office that wasn't filled. Um, so I, 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 would, I would actually say that I think that we've um, decreased our, our staff in the last five years or held flat. I don't believe we've added um, to our town staff because we have been mindful of that and knowing that it's employee expenses that drive our budget between salaries and benefits. I, I don't wanna speak for the deputy mayor, but I believe his point is, wants us to make sure that it's known that if the person is hired, that it's a grant five year funded with no guarantee of future employment. Absolutely. Again, that would because be the- it's not the same, I'm sorry. It's not the same thing as necessarily eliminating or not filling positions, which the point is well noted. I think that you're right, Amy, that the town has done that. I think Tom's point is slightly different. Well, and all I was gonna say is that in the health field with a lot of federal grants that have these up to five year commitments that the, the people that you hire are aware of that, that, that they're looking at jobs of those nature. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Um, I'll make a motion to authorize the town manager to apply and accept this federal grant, the Strategic Prevention Framework Partnerships for Success Grant. I'll second that. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. No overtime tonight. <laughs> uh, and we have a um, something from the state here. Uh, I think the town manager has a little bit more detail, but uh, the state's proposal for uh, compensation, so we actually <laughs> get some money <laughs> huge, back. Huge, tremendous. Um, this is for the uh, utility easement at the intersection of Spring Street and um, Route 3 Maple Street. Mr. Town Manager. Yep. Thank you, Mayor, and to the Council. Uh, the state's proposing uh, some pedestrian safety improvements, uh, which require utility easement at the intersection of Spring Street and Maple Street, also known as Route 3. Uh, they are willing to compensate us what is being considered fair market value by both the state as well as the town <laughs> for $500 based off of the size of the easement that they're talking about. Um, I have Andrew Silva from the Department of Transportation here to answer any questions you may have. Uh, I did include a, a map in the packet, which uh, if you're in, not an engineer like me, you probably looked at and said, what? Um, but luckily, there were people who could explain it to me. Andrew, you want to come up? We'll put you on the spot. Sure. Can I have a location on the property you have? Do you have one here? <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> you're here and you've the, got them. Why not? <laughs> that's the state of Connecticut for you. Jeez. Nine full-size copies. We use it for wallpaper. Draw this short straw tonight, or what? <laughs> yeah, low man on a totem. I, be I believe he is a town resident, so it's yeah. important to support. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, you were at this 
capital last year, last session. Absolutely. Yep, you're familiar. Yep, yep. Thank so you. So you're used to s sitting around for a while and <coughs> waiting for action to be taken. Thank you. You can leave them right here. We'll we'll make sure they get to the right people. Thank you. This is how I came up with the five hundred dollar. Five fifty. We need to have. Yeah, let's ne let's negotiate. <laughs> and if this works, actually, there may be a position for you at OPM. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do we have three extra copies over there? Because I have yes. Three, I have three counselors. Uh, out. there's. Okay. There's two copies here, so the town manager will have to give up his. Yeah, I have a copy yeah. in my office, so you can have <laughs> Here, pass these all down to Dolores. Let me see. Thank you. All right, so as you can see Andrew, from can I just get you to um, just state your name and where you're from? Oh, okay. Andrew and Silva, just, uh, Connecticut Department of Transportation, 22 Denison Ridge, Weathersfield, Connecticut. So, here you go. So, uh, the department is seeking to make intersection improvements at the Route 3 Spring Street and Middletown Avenue intersection, and as such, we need to acquire a defined traffic easement for traffic equipment and appurtenances on a parcel that is owned by the town of Wethersfield. So that is why I'm here. And in the the town manager received my offer in the amount of, or the state's offer, in the amount of $500. And he also received a copy of the property map. And we discussed this intersection plan for what's happening at this intersection. So if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Anybody have any questions? One, Deputy Mayor. Maybe for town manager, I'm not sure. but. Is there going to be any additional costs to the town of Weathersfield for this as far as like um, filing these maps and so forth or is there, any, is there any additional out of pocket expenses or time and effort by our staff to uh, no, that will be handled by the state. We have a right. closing department and we would draft the easement. We would order the check. We would then and get the map miler. We would come to the town manager, he would sign the easement document, record we'd it. hand over the check, and then we go to the town clerk's office and record all the documents, and then we'd give you a copy for your records. Very good, that's the answer we wanted. And we, <laughs> we would even charge them the state fee to do so. As yes, part of so the our, our fee is yeah. less than what residents would pay if they mm -hmm. went to go file documents. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions at all? Um, I do have to make a um, quick uh, motion to amend the motion um, so if you don't mind my indulgence the um, the um, the additional after um, Maple Street Route 3 this needs to be uh, contingent upon a uh, favorable um, planning and zoning Commission 824 approval if I'm not mistaken we have to go through planning and zoning for something like this okay. so I think, um, I don't know if the agenda has come out already for planning and zoning yet, if we can get this on. So we won't be able to make the one for tomorrow, but we will be able to for the second one, which would still meet your deadline for February 28th. Perfect. Yep. yep. Um, so I would make a motion to add contingent upon a favorable planning and zoning commission 824 review. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to amend the motion. Now with the- Well, we um, didn't make a motion yet. No, no, that's just to amend it. That's just to amend the motion. Now for the actual motion. Well, what, what are we amending? We didn't make a motion yet. Oh. You just have to make a motion Mayor with that motion in it. Amend. amend what? We didn't make a motion. You just have to add that to your motion, right? I made a motion to <laughs> amend the motion. There was no motion on the table, though. So just make the motion with make that motion wording in it. Amend. You just made it. Well, someone and can make a motion. Seconded. Yeah. <laughs> right. So just make All the motion, and then the deputy mayor seconded it. Yep. All okay. those in favor of, of amending the motion. No. 
you don't need that. So I think <laughs> motion as your motion yeah. was removed. Yeah, just okay. right. So you could do it as one. As one. Okay. So now I make a motion to do it as one. <laughs> a motion to authorize the town manager to execute any and all documentation related to accepting the state's proposal and compensation of $500 to allow for a utility easement at the intersection of Spring Street and Maple Street Route 3 contingent upon a favorable planning and zoning commission 8-24 review. Perfect. I can second. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Motion I'll carries. I'll take it on the chin. That was my fault Ed on advising the mayor. Um, may I just make one other comment? Do we need to make a formal 824 review motion at this time? Or did that suffice? No, we will do it. So we need to make a formal motion. No. no. That was that, it. That counts Perfect. as a motion. Okay. That one. Yep. <laughs> We're on there. Sorry, okay. Carrie. <laughs> yes. I took my advice from the town manager. That was my fault. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we just have oh, the land lease request, um, Mr. Town Manager. I got one right here. Thank you for staying so late. <laughs> yes. You, you also can't get overtime. <laughs> Thank you to the town council, uh, to the mayor and the, the council. Um, this is, uh, I'll call it a very unique um, experience. Uh, I was recently approached by, um, by a business owner who had some interest in doing dealings in the town. I know from my research that this conversation has been, a similar conversation has been kicked around within the community. Uh, for several years uh, with nothing ever coming to it. Um, in conversation with staff, I don't want to discuss what the opportunity is because I'm not looking to, to, to show favoritism, to taint the process. What I'm looking for is to create a transparent process uh, to entertain the idea of leasing space at the Cove. Um, in speaking with staff, it would be a pretty uh, considerable process which would require a number of public meetings, um, open dialogue, um, and overall communication with council, uh, commission members, and the residents as a whole. Um, the best approach if we're going to head down this path is to do a request for proposals um, to create that dialogue with the public. Um, and the plan would be to create a request to solicit interest for leasing that space to see if there's other parties who might be interested in using a parcel of land um, at the Cove. Based off of that, we would narrow down the interest um, and work with that particular, uh, who, you know, whoever seemed to have the best proposal, work with that particular individual to meander through a process meeting with all the various boards or uh, recommendations from parks and recreation, zoning if necessary, planning and zoning, historic district if necessary, heritage and tourism commissions um, uh, to see what stipulations would be needed or put into a lease agreement um, to actually negotiate a lease with a selected or multiple selected vendors uh, to provide amenities in Cove Park um, through a lease agreement. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of questions. Councilwoman Bella. So, um, I would be supportive of some proposals and not supportive of others. So, I'm not sure how I would vote for an RFP on amenities in Cove Park. Now, my husband and I walk through Cove Park all the time, and we always say, oh my gosh, wouldn't it be great if there was a taco truck in Cove Park? Um, we would not like a dog walking uh, doggy daycare in Cove Park. We would not like a vape shop in Cove Park. So I guess I'm having trouble approving a blank, like an RFP that could literally be for anything. Um, because like I said, if you want to put a taco truck down there, I will be the first person in line. But if you want to, or if you want to rent canoes or kayaks um, from a vendor down there, I would be first in line. But I, I'm just not sure. I don't know if maybe we should table it or we should re 
think maybe just um, the wording or the process, but um, like I said, I, I would be supportive of some sporting um, ideas or maybe restaurant venues, but there are a lot that I wouldn't be supportive, so I, I, I'm a little concerned that the RFP is kind of too vague to, um, is too vague for me. Um, and I don't know if there's another um, mechanism to go about it, if you could, you know, like this RFP to P planning and zoning, but if there's a way to bring about this discussion, because again, I'm not opposed to it. I think there's some great, um, there are potentially some great uses uh, for an underutilized area in our community. Um, I would just wonder if there's another way we can get it through some of these. I know, P, you know, it's got to go through Park and Rec and Lynn Wetland, Harbor Management, yada, yada. Um, but I'm just not sure uh, I can support a blank RFP for God knows what. And not that I don't trust you, town manager, on keeping, you know, a vape shop out of there. I just, I, I, wa I guess I would want to have a little more say in, in that aspect of, of it. Sure, respond. Um, so I, I would obviously entertain, uh, through the council's pleasure, um, restrictions, uh, uh, verbiage, um, you know, changes in the requirement of the process. Um, the process is a very lengthy one, so I'm, um, you know, from the time you started to the time you finished could be a very long time. So I, if possible, wouldn't mind vetting out some of the ideas or, um, and I could come back to you at another meeting as well, or I, I could even agree to it here um, as to what the restrictions are. I think my purpose of the blanket, and by the way, I appreciate the comment that you trust me. Um, <laughs> sort of. I won't put vape. <laughs> yeah, only to an extent, right? You can only trust so much. Uh, uh, I think my intention with the RFP is to make it um, as transparent enough so no one says, well, you'll only entertain this type of business, or you only want that business because they reached out to you. Um, I think I've heard a number of great ideas um, in the past several years, of, and I think you, you know, mentioned a couple um, on the positive, not so much the vape. So, <laughs> you know, I, I'm willing to adjust this as necessary um, with the understanding that obviously they have to go through so many different commissions mm -hmm. um, that no matter what, um, at some point there'll be a commission that will say no way, no how, doesn't fit, doesn't, it's got to be consistent with plan of conservation and development and other plans within the town. Um, so the idea is it, it almost becomes naturally confined, but I'm more than willing to entertain any types of restrictions to create the correct RFP. Mr. Deputy Mayor. I have a, some correspondence from one of the residents uh, regarding this proposal. And uh, the questions came up if we were to approve something like this at Cove Park, um, would that then extend to other town parks, Mill Woods, Standish Park? Um, the other comment which I agree with is that, is this in keeping with our Cove Park master plan, um, our plan of conservation and development, harbor management plan, all these plans that we put a lot of time and effort and money into, and then we tend not to always follow them very closely. Um, maybe one taco truck would be very nice. <laughs> I, I can envision a line of food trucks, four or five, and I wouldn't want to see that in, in mm -hmm. Cove Park or any other park in, in our town. You know, if we have a uh, refreshment stand in Mill Woods, that was put up in the 90s, and I wasn't aware of it, but it, or I'm sorry, it's put up before the 90s. It hasn't been used since the 90s. Okay. It's boarded up. We, we used to have a contract with a vendor. People would bid on it, and they would operate that as a service to kids swimming and so forth, but it has a couple restrooms. It's all boarded up, so, you know, maybe this plan hasn't been thought out enough where they might not get enough volume to, to sustain their business. At Cove Park quite a while ago, there was a fellow that tried a hot dog stand right at the entrance to the Cove. That was one season and never to be seen again. It just didn't work. 
Um, personally, I kind of like the Cove being a, just a natural place, not having all those amenities. So you can go down there and bring your picnic basket and sit there and have lunch and watch the boat. But my comments. Matt. Please. Um, so I trying to think which one I want to touch upon. The RFP, um, I, th I think, would probably have some restrictions, right, as to how the use would be. Um, you know, I, I don't, it's an interesting point about multiple vendors uh, and multiple trucks in the concern. Um, I think just the resident concern, could you just repeat some of the comments? It was something I wanted to tag on. I just wanted to make sure that it was in keeping with the Cove master plan, the Millwoods master plan, 2013 plan of conservation and development, harbor management plan, and the various strategic plans that the town has. That's what it was. Right. So that would go through the process where it would have to touch upon all of those plans. We would actually include that as part of the RFP, um, consistency with existing plans. They would have to go to harbor management plan because it's in there. They would have to meet all the... Um, the requirements, restrictive requirements associated with the fact that it is um, a, uh, HDC if it's if it's year round, if it's temporary, I would probably bring it to HDC regardless um, of of whether or not just it's you know important to get their buy-in. It's it's um, it's but, temporary for but, sure. But harbor management, um, right? Because it is keeping in mind that you're talking about floodplain, you're talking about. Um, you know, would they be able to provide you around? It's because it's floodplain, whatever it is would have to come in and come out. So it would have to be consistent with um, considerate uses for the area. I we would have to address all of those. And I suspect if we, if the town were to approve one operation, it would be very difficult, I think, from a legal standpoint to deny someone else access to that. Uh, Almost like a zoning change, you know. Respectfully, I, I disagree because we can lease, we can choose to lease a property under contra contracted terms however we wish. We can't close off the park to the public and say, you know, and restrict it, but in terms of using the property for that, or, you know, that's why we're entering into an agreement. You know, that being said, I wouldn't enter into an agreement that, uh, that wouldn't be consistent with the use of the property. Um, ultimately, I report to the council. My job is to bring this information forward. Um, I'm not advocating in either direction other than part of the intent of the RFP process is to vet out whether or not it could even work. I, well, I, um, I, I think it's got some merit to it. And, you know, you and I did have um, some conversations about this prior to um, being put on the agenda, um, you know, my hope was to uh, to have the RFP tailored such a way that, you know, it would welcome enough people to come and and submit, and knowing that they would have to go through, you know, a number of commissions and boards and plans to do it. Um, I I don't know right now. I would like to think about this a little bit further. Um, maybe not make a motion to or table. Yeah, I'm maybe. happy to make a motion to table to the next meeting to get some more information or to have parties work with the town manager to um, perhaps narrow or put in some verbiage, maybe to in some way. I would also like draft to RFP perhaps or something. Yeah, yeah so something. I'd also like to get maybe some input from the town attorney on whether or not if a, a too narrow of an RFP precluding others w would be permissible or not. So. Yeah, I mean, it, it, again, conversations would have to occur, but you know, could you put out an RFP that says um, for a restaurant or uh, sport groups or, you know, I mean, I, we all, are probably in agreement we don't want a, re a temporary retail establishment there I wouldn't think we probably you know we wouldn't want anything that would be noisy like 
a doggy daycare business or, Stop bringing up the doggy you know, daycare. I just, you're you know, killing me. I am killing you. Um, but I just think there should be some parameters. It shouldn't be as broad as it is now. So I would be happy to make the motion to table. I want to make sure we finish our discussion before I make that motion because it cuts off the discussion. But um, I don't know how others feel. I, I just want to say that I like the idea of it being very broad because, I mean, there are so many hoops that in so many commissions and boards, God bless anyone who's willing to go through this process. <laughs> I mean, it's it, true. really. So I feel like the cove is underutilized. There's so much unrealized potential. It's, you know, it's beautiful the way it is, but I feel like it could, this would enhance it. I say cast a wide net. I don't think you're going to get, I, I mean, just if people see what they have to go through, and the you, you, yeah, I know, and more, I know, or and others, and I could think of a few others. So, I think, y you know, that you're not going to end up with a doggy daycare or a vape <laughs> shop because there's so many hoops. I hope we end up with something because I feel like the process is going to be. It's it. Om I read this and I thought, oh my god, we have to. We want to encourage businesses to come and not do this to them. Although I do realize the Cove is a unique part, you know, parcel and it's not just any other commercial, you know, district or anything, but um, so I kind of like the idea of it being broad, but I might be in the minority there. I, so I actually uh, I agree with Mary. I mean, I think the broader, the better here because, I, you know, my thought process was what do we want there? Um, and do we like, for instance, like a kayak vendor is a kayak vendor going to go through this cumbersome process? Probably not. It'll go to Glastonbury or somewhere else. Um, so maybe we should start thinking about all right, what is an ideal scenario of what types of um, vendors do we want to service down there? What does that look like to all of us? Um, and then you know we can kind of go through the RFP process looking through those lenses as well because if you make it too cumbersome, what's the point of going through the process? Both. Fallon, Deputy Mayor. Mm. Do we not have this Cove Park master plan? And what does that say about development? <coughs> I haven't read it myself. I don't know what it contains, but I would think it would give the town residents views on what they wanted to see done with the Cove Park. I can only go back to a year ago when I reviewed it, but I, th I think Mayor's looking at it, but I believe there was something in it about developing it, but I don't know if it's particular to that part of Cove Park or Cove Park as a whole, which includes the other side closer to the state side. Mm -hmm. All things to, to be researched. Um, you know, to your point, whoever goes there, it is going to be a cumbersome process. That's the unfortunate positive and negative of bureaucracy of government, right? We're there to protect the residents as a whole. Um, but, and sometimes the businesses have to jump through some hoops to make sure that we do that. Um, that being said, you know, I can, I can curtail the RFP. We can, we can narrow it down enough where it's still broad enough where we're not necessarily going to deter anyone. Um, and ultimately anyone who goes there is going to have to make an investment of some level there. Um, to make whatever happens works. I think I've kind of started drafting the RFP already just to get a feel for what I think needs to go into this type of RFP. Um, frankly, I wish I could have brought it here, but um, there's just so much time to work on those things. But um, the reality is it would have to be very tight, right? Because whatever you put there would have to have some history, some experience, whoever goes there. You don't want just anyone, as an example, with a hot dog cart hoping to make it happen. It's got to be something that has um, has the ability to survive, and the person would have to probably have a, depending upon what it is, a decent amount of capital um, investment, or or have the capital to sustain it over a long period of time. Whether it's a vendor or a rest um, for kayaks or a restaurant, right? There's still upfront costs that they're going to have to hit. So may I make a motion to table? Second. Motion to table uh, and a second is on the uh, table. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you. Oops. 
got minutes. Everybody's got a copy of the minutes. Just one second to read through them if you haven't read through them already. Motion to approve the minutes as submitted. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Motion carries. And finally, public comment. Mr. Coantonio. Good evening, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Uh, I wasn't like, going to say anything tonight, but uh, the new truck or the truck that uh, it's proposed, I guess it was uh, proposed last year too. And something comes to mind, you know, when I was growing up, it says, you know, that uh, you buy a car two or three years later, you, you buy another one and you buy another one. And, you know, the sooner you turn them over, the more costly they are or less effective. I have a, a 1998, 1999 truck, 160,000 miles. Is it the best truck around? No, it still works for me. It's my donkey. That's what I recall it. <laughs> you know, to spend $200,000, it's a lot of money for something that it's not broken. In other words, it's just like, you know, my wife says, hey, see you're getting too old. Get out of here. Die, you know. Just because something gets old, that doesn't mean we have to get rid of it. I have a car in the garage. I haven't used it in the past 25 years. 1970, 78, BMW, I love it. I'll never drive it again, but I love it. I will never sell it. So I guess uh, I tend to keep things too long. Uh, so I do not agree to buy a new truck until we need it. Uh, tonight was educational too. I, I, I never knew that basically uh, the snow plows, the way they work, you know, interesting. You know, I always thought that uh, the snow plows, on my street at least anyway, they go by too many times. And now I understand that the first time up and down, I guess, you know, it's just to provide, uh, you know, a clean street so emergency, uh, you know, trucks and whatnot, uh, ambulance can go by. I think that's great. But on my street, though, the second time around, when you say curb to curb, it's impossible to see where the curb is. Every year there is, like, you know, curbing all over the place now. Every year you got to replace it. So I would be happy and I would uh, consider, like, you know, just go a couple times and that's it. Never mind curb to curb. And then, you know, the question came up again. You know, it says, well, informational says, when there is no snow shelf, we go by there and we remove the snow only when I call and bitch and complain. Because since they did the new sidewalks, before we never had any snow shelf. But it, there is still a section on Morrison Avenue between uh, Orchard and Tifton on the south side that there is no snow shelf. Before we used to have a 30-foot road, now we have a 24-foot road it's a little bit less on a corner there. And yet, nobody really removes the snow. Why? Because not enough politicians live there or what? Or not enough uh, important people live there? I've been there since 1973 and I pay taxes every, every year. Never complain, you know. As a matter of fact, like, you know, for me, I recycle everything. So, uh, you know, with this uh, <laughs> garbage that keeps on going up, I think you, you make out with me because, you know, I recycle. There was another thing too. Yeah, at the bottom of the street now, there is, there is a pothole. You know why there is a pothole there all the time, every couple of years? It's because the drainage doesn't really drain properly. And not too long ago, a few years ago, they did uh, a manhole, in, you know, all the manholes on that street. Well, in front of my house, when the cars go over, like, you know, it makes noise. Why? It's not level, I guess, you know. And something needs to be done. Uh, so, but anyway, it's late. Thank you. It was very interesting tonight. Good night. Interesting to say the least. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. Mr. Young.
Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Uh, while you were discussing uh, the, uh, the truck, it was mentioned that you would prefer to pay cash, which I think we should. Because, you know, we have a load of, I think we have nine, nine items this year, 2020, that we're going to have to pay lease payments on. That, that amounts to $952,000. Uh, that's off of one of Mr. O'Neill's reports. And, uh, you know, it, it consists of anything from the town-wide radio, a Freightliner plow truck, which I think you wanted to get, we were talking about tonight. Uh, there was a Stepin fire truck. There's a five-year equipment lease. I don't know what that is. There's another dump truck. There's a payloader. There's a police interceptor. There's turf replacement. And then there's rolling stock for a two physical year 2018. But that comes up to like $952,000. And as I've said, with the way our progressives here in town have been, been borrowing or buying on, on credit, there's going to be a point where, as you said tonight, we'd rather pay cash. But you're going to pay cash, plus you've got to make the payments that you bought stuff years ago. And it, it, it's like a, it, it just comes down on top of you. It, 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 everything falls in. And that's something the progressives just don't understand when you go out and borrow. And then, of course, what's going to be put on here this year? Did you pay cash for the Keisha farm? I don't think so. I think you went out on a bond. And that's going to be, end up in here somewhere as well. How many other things did you buy? Thinking back over the last year. So that's not on this report. So I, I really think, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a strong believer of paying cash for it, and it's yours. I don't believe in this stuff. But we now have to pay for it. And, you know, coming back to what Jillison, is that his name that was here before from the MDC? Jillison. Yeah. Jillison. He, he, he said something about the, the people voted for. I didn't vote for any of that. And that's why I'm up here complaining. They, 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 have, they have ripped us off. They have done such poor management. But as I'm talking about that, and I, and I really came here tonight to talk about something else. But I guess I, never, I won't get on to that. But, you know... The, the, the MDC expects to get some kind of loan from the state of Connecticut for whatever projects, expanded projects. <coughs> not, ex, not projects that they said originally they were going to do. The, the original ones were 1.6 million. Then they expanded it. And now they want to expand some more. This is management that's building their own empire. But anyway, they expect loans from the bankrupt state of Connecticut their own operating, their own operating expenses are high because they're, they, they, are, they have an extremely high volume of, of product to sell. And they have a lot less product of the of buyers that want their product. And I don't remember from economics what they call that. But there's, there's, a, there's a word back uh, in some other places that, that we could use on this. But I think they mentioned 200 billion, whatever. But they're only selling 45 billion. It sounds to me like a mismanagement on their part. They can complain all they want about the state of Connecticut. I complain about them too. But they're the ones in charge. They're the ones that wanted the job. And those are the ones who are overtaxing us. And then, you know, Mayor, you made a comment. If we had known 16 years ago where, the, where we would be, and I didn't understand after that what you said, but what I said 16 years or 15, when they, when they came out with this first bond was no, the second bond was no, and this third one would be no. If we had known back in the first one, how many people would have voted against it? And then we heard tonight about Murrah. They need more money, too. 
for their trash business from the state, from us. We hear about the state pensions that are way underwater. And then we hear about, we read in the paper a couple weeks ago where the state of Connecticut a year ago was offering $6.1 million to buy a piece of property down in Orange, Connecticut. That DOT said was only worth 566000 And then they say, then they come up to the podium and they say we should trust them. Trust them my foot. Mr. Young. And then we look at the Keisha farm. $1.7 million is what they had on their appraisal here in the town of Wethersfield when they went to negotiate. And they gave them $2.4 million. And they refused. The town council at that time refused to let the citizens see that appraisal okay. of $1.7 million because they didn't have anything higher than that. We appreciate it. Yes, sir. I'm, I thank you very much. But trust... Not on your life or mine. No one else here willing to speak? Um, the motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. We're adjourned. Sir, can you um, ask?